Okay, calling the meeting to order. This is this meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commission is being videotaped at RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street, Reading, Massachusetts, for distribution to the community television stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It's the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. All right, we have uh, Jason Small from the Citizen Advisory Board. Welcome, Jason. Welcome, Jason. And uh, we also have Dave Talbert, the Secretary. Thank you. And let's see if we have any public comment. Well, doesn't look like we have any public comment. But I do have a comment. I want to make a recognition of um, somebody that's leaving our organization. It's a very bittersweet day here at RMLD because Jane Parento is somebody we all love working with. She's the Director of Integrated Services and she's a real power broker for, for real and started at <laughs> started uh, 26 years ago as an energy analyst here and um, we really enjoy working with you Jane and we're going to miss you as you go and take over the general manager job and Holden, right? And uh, we'll miss your humor. Yeah. yeah. Ditto, thank you, Jane, for your always very cooperative and uh, supportive. And thank you. you have a good sense of humor, which is critical to be uh, in, in any job. That's right, <laughs> especially working with this, this group here. It's great. <laughs> and you're a great ambassador to, for the RMLD brand with all the stakeholders. So yep. we'll miss you. Thank you very much. All right, we have some approval of board minutes. We have a motion on this one. A move that the board approve the meeting minutes of July 19th, 2018 and September 20th, 2018 on the recommendation of the general manager. Second. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries, 4-0-0. And a report on the Citizens Advisory Board meeting on October 9th. Mr. Stempeck? Uh, yes, it was uh, uh, a great meeting. Um, I think there were excellent questions by the CAB on the uh, both the capital and the operating budget, um, and uh, which was approved. Uh, both of which were approved. We'll see here later tonight. Um, uh, the, uh, there's so much information, especially in the sort of capital budget, that it's it was uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, the, the question was whether it could have been formatted slightly differently, and I think we're probably going to see that here tonight. Or are we not? I mean, yeah. So, so, but there's there's so much to do involved in the capital uh, budget that I think they were correct in questioning exactly that. Right. Good. Jason, we, if you were there, do you want to make any comments as well? Or nope, I think uh, John covered it. He covered it. All right. He usually does. He's. Yep. Oh, John, you're next He'll on the smother agenda it. too. <laughs> <laughs> he smothers it. You're next on the agenda here, the Verizon and AT&T. It says, ask Mr. Stempak about that. Oh, this was really a question that I had seen in the uh, paper about uh, Verizon, AT&T, and other carriers. Uh, and, and hopefully we can just keep this relatively short here in terms of uh, at least raising it for a topic and maybe use it for discussion at some point in the future. Uh, that uh, as we move in from 4G into 5G, which is a transmission short distance transmission that uh, Verizon, AT&T, and, and other carriers are uh, looking at to basically put mini cell towers on every telephone pole. I mean, that's what it, what it amounts to. And uh, the, so the question is, how much might we realize from the rental of at least our poles uh, relative to Verizon's poles within our territory? And I believe, uh, Colleen, you've mentioned in the past that that may be a set fee. Well. Indeed, it said, at least in the newspaper article, that it would be a set small fee as opposed to what, say, Boston is realizing, which is three to five times what that fee is. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, can we realize more fee for rental of our space on our telephone poles? And I don't mean to seek an answer to that tonight, but I think it's a very valid question because I think the 5G is coming on as much faster than we ever thought. 
and I think it is going to be implemented by all the various carriers. So it's in our financial best interest to see what we might be able to obtain from that rental space. That was basically the That's question. Great. Who sets the rates, like the ones in Boston? Who, who's the, the one? The DPU. No, Colleen, would you care? Um, so the question comes down as to whether or not wireless is wireless is considered a utility, right? So Comcast uh, and uh, is a utility, uh, and it is state mandated what the calculation has to be. So you can't just set the attachment fee. So because we own the pole 50/50 with Verizon, uh, we split the the set rental fee. Uh, depending on what set area uh, is in. So when wireless, if it was to become a utility, so those people who were able to secure, whether it's true 5G or, or not, um, were able to rent out their poles at a negotiated price. But as soon as they say, okay, this is, this is a utility, a wireless antenna is a utility, then it becomes a set attachment fee. So we have some uh, legal information on that that I can send along. Uh, it's, it's brand new as far as the discussion is concerned, so I haven't even gone through all the paperwork myself. Um, but there's a lot of other questions, like if you have those up there, who, who works on them? You know, right. because now you're on the other side of the high energy primaries, you know, so you have to have rated people installing them or working on them. So there's a lot of questions that are still there that, um, you know, are we going to be doing work, service work for Verizon? I mean, you know, there's legal matters that have to do with providing services um, like that. So there's a lot of things that have to be answered before I think we can, you know, other than they're coming. And whether it's not so that you can continuously stream or whether it's going to support autonomous cars uh, because the small cell only penetrates right underneath essentially the pole. So you go pole to pole to pole to pole and you can have maybe up to five or six carriers at the top of one pole. So it's a lot. It's a lot of data that's going to be right. sent out for a number of reasons. So let me do a little bit more research and I'll provide you, um, you know, how we see it and, and what the impacts to the RMLD will be. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yes. Um, thanks David. for bringing that up, John and, and Colleen. It, it would be great to have a report maybe at the next meeting on what what we're getting in terms of requests from the carriers. Um, a couple of things to add to this. As you said, it may not be 5G. Just densifying the exi existing networks is what they need to do now. Uh, in addition to attaching, they'll need backhaul for the for the the small cells, which means they're going to need fiber optic infrastructure. And some of them are leasing from. Crown Castle, some of them are releasing directly from the municipals in, in some cases that I've heard about. So that's another piece of this. And although we may not be able to regulate what that FCC ruling that you're referencing, John, the FCC wants to say that limit what we can charge to, for the attachment, that'll right. be litigated. Um, we'll see how that plays out. But either way, a, a municipal or other utility can regulate the technical sizing and standards and so forth separate from the um, the cost of the backhaul sounds very interesting, though. I mean, that may be yeah, the outside of uh, what's the backhaul? Uh, how, oh, the data that we receive from the 5G, um, actually, when you're probably broadcasting through the 5G as well as what you receive back, it has to go back someplace, right? I mean, it doesn't do it wirelessly. Typically, it gets collected at a at a server someplace, which is served by a fiber optic cable that's coming in. We have fiber optic cables, so yeah. So they need each cell needs power, and it needs fiber strand to deliver the data to the radio on top of the pole that then gets distributed wirelessly to you. Right. So where does that come from? Maybe they have their own. Maybe they lease it from Crown Castle. Maybe they lease it from the municipal. There, there's a business play there. What it exactly looks like you know, is what we should be thinking about. We, we haven't had any formal requests as of yet. For attachments so at all? No. Okay. Correct me. No formal attachment requests, correct? We haven't received any. Now. No. But one of the concerns that I have operationally So one of the concerns that I have operationally is that, you know, well, if they're going to put these radios in the municipal uh, range, range, because we have the poles broken down to electric and uh, right. municipality and uh, also the communication zone, 
I mean, uh, that could involve some, some safety, operational safety issues, or create some operational safety issues. <clears throat> so generally, we would like them to set their own dedicated pole, uh, so, and we provide service to them so they don't interfere with our operations. Or, uh, you know, if they want to go up all the way to the top of the pole, which usually, you know, the higher, you know, the 5G and 6G or 7G as, as they come in, they need direct line of sight. That means they're going to have to go higher. Right. And that's going to create some problems because if they get into the primary zone, the 13,800 volts, now anytime, you know, we want to operate and you know, we're going to have to, you know, if they want to maintain that, we're going to have to shut down the line basically for them to operate. So that's why we would prefer them to have their own dedicated pole so we don't, they don't have to interfere with our but that would mean two <coughs> poles, may potentially. That could side mean by two side, poles, right? right. Yeah. But uh, you know, with this 5G, they're not. They don't have. It's not like you know they're gonna have to do, uh, install these units every other pole. So I'm sure when they do the radio study, the entire area coverage, m maybe in other area, it's not more than like 20 or 30. <coughs> Once every 20 or 30 poles. No, it, it could be because we just did a radio study for our own, you know, with, uh, with the uh, 5.6 mega gigahertz and also the 900 megahertz for our smart grid devices. And I believe the, the report that came back, it was like, you know, like about 20, 28 to 30 radios overall system wide. So they have to do their own radio study, radio propagation, and see how many of these units they do, they need. But it's not like, you know, they need 100 or 200 of these. And depending on the site and where they need to be exactly, that's another factor. Right. So there should be a study, really. There should be a comprehensive study, and then they're going to have to look at our radio study, just making sure that, you know, we don't, we don't have interest in the same location exactly for our own purposes. So this should be... Like what Colin said, the study and also right. cooperation. I mean, certainly, <coughs> towns like Reading will have to be concerned about the aesthetics of yes, multiple exactly. poles and whatnot, too. Yeah. I'm concerned with uh, what Hamid is saying is correct, <coughs> but if you have times 20 <coughs> carriers, right. you know, exactly. Verizon, mobile, oh. now you're talking about every pole. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, installing new poles, I mean, that's right. what I'm saying. We, we need to look at it and then, um, <coughs> you know, let you know the impact. We also have frequency impacts that could be affect our switches. Right. I mean, we're <coughs> using radio frequencies too, so mm -hmm. we want all the baby monitors hitting each other, you know what I mean? So <laughs> we, have to, we have a lot right. of things that we have to look at. Good analogy, I like that, Colleen. Thank you, thank <laughs> it's you. Good. Good. You always pull at least one of those out for a board <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Everybody always goes, I get it. Yeah, yeah I get that's it. good, I, I get, get that. <laughs> good. Great, thank All you. right, good. So I think we're ready for the capital budget. I think oh. you're staying there. Yeah. Don't go anywhere, I mean. Yeah. That's a little spreadsheet. The legal, the legal document, legal yeah, size document. Size. This is not legal. This is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's bigger than legal. Did, yeah. <coughs> did, did you want to mention that we're delaying this one item though? Oh yeah, we're going out of order for anybody tracking our agenda closely. We're, number seven is going to go towards the end when Phil Pacino gets back. Thank you for. I was. Gonna, I meant to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening. I'm presenting the five years capital uh, authorization projects, uh, uh, the budget. Basically, you'll be approving uh, the budget for CY19. Also, the first half of the year, the second half of the uh, year of 2018, which is the f first half of the FY19, which is July 2018 through December 2018. So you see the column uh, on the left, the first column is uh, uh, the FY19 budget, which was already approved. The second column is from July to December, the estimate. And the third column is the CY19 plan uh, estimate. And the rest of the columns from CY20 to 24, those are the estimates that, you know, for the projects that, that they have uh, multiple years and they're ongoing. And uh, so the, the, they need, they need the, the fund to be appropriated. Uh, also, on the very first column on the left, you see the line numbers and the then next page numbers, which they correspond to to the book that you have, mm -hmm. that you could you know correlate that if you need more information. You could see the 
a capital project cost sheet in back of each project. On the face, you see uh, they explain that, you know, what the purpose of the project is, the intention, and what it entails, how many years it takes to, you know, to, from the start to finish. And in the back, you have the cost sheet associated with it, which says uh, the design, engineering, labor, materials, whatever that, you know, is associated with that particular project. So I'm going to be covering, uh, basically explaining those projects that you see that they, they got grid lines on them, the blue on CY19. And uh, if you have questions on the rest of the budget, I'll be more than happy to go over that with you. But these are basically the highlights. Uh, the so <clears throat> the first one is the line number one on page 11 of your book. Uh, that's the uh, RMRD uh, LED upgrade program. This is up to upgrade the Ashes Street and as well as the other facilities, the substations uh, with new interior, exterior LED fixtures. So that's going to cost approximately $200,000. Uh, so that's what the, that's a price for engineering, design, and materials, and installation, basically. That's what <coughs> it entails. The next one is line number three or page 13. It's a parking lot upgrade, 230 Ashes Street. This is to reconfigure the parking lot at 230 Ashes Street in order to make accommodations <coughs> for the EV chargers. We already installed one, so this is to, re to reconfigure in order to be able to <coughs> add more EV chargers. And that is going to cost approximately $230,000. The next one is line number four on your spreadsheet, or page 15, which is building upgrades that includes the 230 Ashes Street lobby installation. Uh, station 4AC and OSHA compliance study. As you know, we just recently did the OSHA study, uh, and it's an audit, self-audit, and we basically, it was good. They said that, you know, well, we are right on track. Uh, there are some minor issues, some minor stuff that needs to be taken care of uh, that, you know, we need to, uh, to appropriate some money. Part of that money is going to be paying for that. <coughs> so it's a two, it's a, uh, the, the cost of that, would be uh, uh, $125,000. I mean, can I have a yes. question? And I've sure. noticed the following year you expect a, a doubling almost of that cost. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's not for uh, yeah, well, for OSHA every year we put some money aside. However, in order to uh, get to the uh, get to uh, in the, the, the station four station four AC. We're not sure how much that's going to cost. That's one of the ideas that we have. We just have placeholder for it, okay. just in case that, you know, we need to get, because that station is one of the older stations mm -hmm. uh, after Station 5, okay. and we need to do some structural work in order to probably accommodate that. So that's why. Can I interrupt, Mr. Chairman? <coughs> mm -hmm. I think that the notes on the right-hand side is <coughs> the entire project. Right. I think what you're trying to ask, and, and maybe Hamid can be a little bit more specific, is the 125 in CY19 is the lobby insulation or the station for AC or the OSHA compliance. Okay. So that is basically focus stage on on station four. Focus on this year. Uh, yeah. Just focus yeah. on this AC, year. Okay. Yeah, for okay. AC and the lobby, lobby insulation. That's what it what entails. So, thank you. You're welcome. The next project is uh, line item number eight, and that's page 25 for $60,000. That's for electric vehicle supply equipment, EVSE. And every year, you know, we, the, the plan is to install two electric charging stations per ton this in our service area. And this is what the, we are hoping we can get grants. The last year, we got a grant for $3,000 for one. And, you know, we're going to get the grant, like $6,000, hopefully, you know, use the state grant in order to uh, fund it. So that's why you see $60,000, you know, for going, going forward. Uh, the next project is uh, line item number 10, uh, page number 27. It's a battery storage unit at Station 3, $20,000. This is for that 5-megawatt battery uh, storage plan that we're going to be installing at the station three, the twenty thousand dollars is paying for some of the uh, interconnection uh, ma uh, stuff that you know we need to do in order to connect it to our system, interconnection work. <coughs> uh, the next project is the grid modernization optimization. That's line item number fifteen on page thirty-six, 
And as you see, the grid optimization entails SCADA-made switches, interrupters. These are the switches for fault detection, isolation, restoration as a part of the uh, automation of the system. The SCADA upgrade, the capacitor bank automations, these are the units that uh, we install for cap banks. The cap banks, the, the, the job that they do basically, they reduce the foam uh, on the beer, if you want to use that analogy. Uh, you know, if uh, the power factor, in order to correct the power factor, you know, and the best analogy for that is beer and foam. So you want less uh, foam and more beer, more liquid, <laughs> right? Better than the baby model <laughs> analogy, I thought. You, you went up to Colleen. That's that right. One. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so these are the foam reducers, basically, on the system, reduce the system losses. So we, uh, we automate those, uh, the units that we need uh, in order to do that. <laughs> and as you see, they, they are ongoing projects that every year we do a, a little bit. Then the next one is software integration because we still need to integrate the AMI with the SCADA-made switches, with the outage management system and all of that integration. And usually it's never going to be that easy and smooth. It's not a cookie cutter. So every uh, piece that you add to the system, you need to do some software integration and making sure that they work properly. So for the switches, we install four switches, four SCADA-made switches a year. That's how it's planned out, the 15-year program. Uh, the two interrupters, uh, the SCADA upgrade, we've already done that, so the system it's all ready, unless if they go for more upgrades that we're going to ask for more money in the future years. The capa capacitor automation, 66,000, and the software integration, 14,000. So that is basically for that uh, system portion of that. Then, as you know, we installed the new outage management system recently. It's uh, they're, they're going through the testing. We are also installing the IVR, that, uh, in, that's interactive voice response that they integrate with the origin management system. So uh, as soon as you know the people, they decide which method of communication, texting, phone, or email, then the system is going to contact them via that, the, 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 the option that you, they choose. And that's going to notify them that we know you're out and what the estimated restoration time would be. Mm -hmm. So that's what that IVR <coughs> is basically. And uh, also, the your just quick question: Why so would anybody choose home phone for that? Because obviously, it won't work if the power's out, right? So you some people probably they prefer that over some people they don't have cell phones, yeah. and you know, and we have to just you know give that provide that option for the people if they choose to. I know most people they have cell phones, and you know they, they have emails, but you know or text, you know if you they, they, mm. they, they you know but. Some people, they might have, you know, still the phone, old phone systems. Or if they, even if they have phone over right. um, uh, Comcast or something like that, when the power right. goes out, Super that's free. toast, too. I mean, that's right. right. Yeah, that's what work. I'm saying. Right. Yeah. That's right. right. <coughs> or they, if they have generators, I don't know, if, you know, the backup system somehow, and they still want to be notified through the phone, that's the way to do that. Okay. So this system is capable of doing that, so we can use all those capabilities in order to be able to get back to the customers yeah. uh, and give them more information about the audit. Another module that we're gonna add, this audit management system has several modules that every year we try to add one more to that, that it's gonna get us more closer and closer to the automation, system automation. And the next one is the crew management. In other words, during the system outages, we're gonna be able to see that, you know, okay, the crew is on pole to Summer Street, and then the next one that, you know, the next assignment, it's, let's say, on two, uh, 22 Main Street. So we could see that, you know, right there going without calling and without coming, and, you know, they, they, that reduces the communication traffic to the control center. So that would be really a good package to have so we know exactly when the uh, crews, they get started, when they finish the job, and when the next assignment, so we can easily manage the outage uh, restoration activity much more efficiently. I mean, if I may, uh, sure. just as a side uh, question uh, in terms of outage management, um, do we have the ability to cause outages in certain areas if we want to selectively do that? I'm thinking of uh, Lawrence and North Andover where they had the gas explosions. Right. And obviously, they shut yes. off the, the power, but you don't want to shut off the power everywhere. You want to shut off where the, the gas lines are uh, coming into the homes. Do we have that? Capability? Very good question. Right now, we don't know. 
But as soon as we have these switches that you are voting to approve, the more there you go. The more and more of those switches we have, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, great. But right now, no. As soon as that's why we do that automation, and you know, and another way to do that really is by if the meters they have the capability of shutting off. You know, but you know that it's going to cost more money. You know, every option is available, but at a price. So, are you so saying that within a year we'll have that? <laughs> no, ability? that's that's a 15-year oh. project. Oh, okay. I mean, we installing like about 100 switches. You know, and these switches, you know, are, are a little bit. Uh, you know, could cost uh, depending on the options that you go on. So we are going very, we being very cautious on, you know, so it's not going to be any. Uh, burden on, on the utility as well as the no, obviously. Mm. Maybe we can get the, the gas company yeah, to pay that, for that. That's right, it, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. But uh, to, uh, again, to answer your questions, the more of these switches we have, we try to locate as these switches, they come up, we got a 15 year plan, we also got exact location of where we want these switches to be installed, so we have the automation and restoration uh, uh, done in a most efficient and productive way. Mm -hmm. So as they come in, you know, we have them all prioritized exactly when the next batch of switches they're going to go on the key locations. And obviously, and what, are, what are the key locations? How do you determine? The key locations, the main feeders that they go on usually at the beginning, we've got the relay at the station, which is already, we've already taken that step of automation. So they can, you know, we can uh, open, close them and join the network like you know in the, like the mesh network that you know they have a team of network this is what it is they call it intelli team mm. intelli team the switches they talk to one another mm. and usually along each feeder you have two or three of these switches installed so these switches they're smart they talk to each other through the radio or through the uh, fiber network and they they're going to say they check with each other the status oh, i'm open i'm closed so they know as soon as the fault goes right through them, they're going to say, oh, okay, I see a fault. I'm going to open up. And then it's going to send a message to the next uh, switch down the line, open up. So we install these on the main feeders. These are not on the laterals. So let's say at the end of the circuit, the last switch, near the last switch, there is a problem. We can, from the office, we can open it up and kill that area manu uh, uh, manually or through the SCADA. Mm -hmm. So to John's question, you'll be able to do it in big areas. Yeah, at the, the big areas, and right. Over but time, you'll be able to that's narrow. That's right. Okay. And then the next step, of, obviously, there would be the laterals, the lateral taps. Yeah. And as you go and automate them, then you can open up the laterals. But right now on the main feeder, which usually they're talking about between two, two switches, you've got about you know, anywhere between 500 to 1,000 customers. So you're going to be able to do that. Mm. Okay. But you won't be able to do, let's say, 50 customers that are affected, then, you know, that, that would be kind of... No, but I would, I would think that like, in the gas example yes. would be a whole series, a whole very series. well defined. That, yeah. would, that would be. Like in Wilmington, we have most of these switches in stock, so Wilmington would be a better shape, hmm. but uh, that's because that's majority of our load, and it's industrial, so that we started there, and then we move in toward Reading, and we installed a few in Linfield, and we have installed a few in uh, North Reading, Okay, and then, but the majority are in the... Uh, the big industrial yeah. areas. Yeah. But we're moving along. It's as we go along, depending on the feeder and the design and configuration and how complicated it is and, you know, how we need to uh, support the load to, you know, during the registration process. So you have to think like a, your computer to say that, you know, okay, this is the logic. This is the uh, order that I want to restore the system. And then that's how you determine which location is the key location for putting these switches up. So it's a pr pretty amazing system. So if, you know, mm -hmm. Sounds like I, if you are interested, I can show it to you at later time. Uh, okay. Thank you. To see that, you know, how automation works. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, you're welcome. <clears throat> okay, so that's for uh, basically that portion. And then the next one, so you see that in a power factor correction. So we spend the next module in CY20 for the power factor connect correction. So these cap banks, they're going to come on, off, online, whenever the system demands to reduce the foam. So that's basically to minimize the losses. So that's what you see. The next project is the new Wilmington substation, line number 16 on your spreadsheet, and that's page 43. Uh, 
We are in negotiation with uh, uh, National Grid for the land that they have on Route 125. Actually, I just got a text from our uh, rep, and uh, they have uh, prepared the uh, letter of intent. So we should have it, they say, by October 31st, you know, mm -hmm. because of the mm, strike mm, situation that it's going on, the union contract. Uh, they're all working around the clock, and, you know, that kind of put, uh, put us in, sure. into... It uh, gave us a d delay uh, on that process. But they have agreed, definitely the intent is to sell, sell the property, and that would be a perfect location for us in order to build the new substation as opposed to the mm, previous location that we had in mind. Uh, and right, that's what access. it is. Better uh, access, right? Better, much better access and shorter run, shorter <coughs> get getaways on Route 125 that we need to go to our Andover Street and going back toward uh, uh, the Route 62 and uh, uh, Wilmington, so and Ballard Vale, that which load is concentrated basically 20 megawatts of load. So, so that's what it, I'm hoping that you know we can hopefully get. I doubt if this is going to be by end of the year closing, but we should have an agreement in place by end of the year. You know, if depending on when we're going to get the P, uh, PNS. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, definitely going the first quarter of 2019, we should have this closed. All right. So uh, under that, uh, you see that, you know, Wilmington substation construction and uh, commissioning, that uh, 69,000. This is for, this is the money that we're going to be paying for conceptual design of the substation getaways and permitting. Uh, which is going to total uh, approximately for $69,000. Uh, and then the majority of the money for construction is going to come, uh, it's going to be spent in CY20 and CY21, which we potentially we're going to go for bonding. You're going to see in the, in the financials that, you know, we're going to uh, bond. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> then uh, the next one is... Uh, uh, on number 18, line item number 18, uh, page 52, um, that's a uh, route 125 pole line installation uh, for the new substations. You see that, you know, we are, right now we're working, making preparations, engineering preparations for that. We're spending 5,000 on CY19. We're spending another 5,000 for prep work for, prep work for the engineering services. And then 613,000 in CY 13 for the construction of the lines. These are the pole lines because there is a section between Ballardvale and Andover Street that there is no pole line. What we're going to have to do, we're going to have to install more poles and get the risers ready for the substation when they build. So because these getaways are the substations, 13-8 getaway, they come in on those poles. So we make the preparation, so it uh, follows right in line with the construction substation and ready to pull the cables in order to, c to build the line. So the next page, <coughs> you see that, you know, line item number 20, page 45. It's a forced account mass DOT on Main Street and Hopkins Street in Reading. This is a placeholder, 225. Again, we're getting reimbursed from the state on this. So that's DOT project for widening the road. Uh, the next three uh, on, on line item 21, 22, 23, which is on page 40, 54, 56, and 58, you see that these are the new, these are the new projects that are added. Uh, the underground line extension on Marion Street, uh, you know, this is the, what we need to extend the line 2,050 feet on Marion Street. Right now, there is a single phase going through that area, and they're like about 50 acres of land, and possibly they're going to be 25 to 50 uh, houses, more houses built. Mm -hmm. And you have to extend the two phases. That's, that's Marion Street is uh, right in between Route 38 and uh, Route uh, 62 on Salem Street and Route 38. So this is a huge area and the load, we see that it's concentrating, so we need to extend the lines. So in is that, that mostly residential? With residential, planning? yes, there? these are the yeah. houses. If we're industrial, you'd put what, three phase in? Uh, it, the industrial, definitely three phase. Yeah. But residential, depending on the number of residentials and the load. These houses, they're humongous. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, 50 houses, 50 to 75 houses. Each one of them, they got like seven kilowatts, you know, demand or you know <coughs> yeah seven you know seven thousand uh, kilowatts or wow. seven hundred kilowatts I'm sorry so 
So uh, we need definitely the third phase, uh, two, two, three phases in order to distribute it uh, evenly among the, you know, the phases. Otherwise, one phase is going to go up and, you know, it's not a good uh, thing to rely on only one phase, mm. uh, especially for the registrations. So the next one is uh, 5W5 Andover Street Road uh, upgrade in uh, Wilmington. There is a thousand feet of open wire uh, that, you know, on that road that it's every year it's giving us hard time, trouble. With the trees and everything, if the branch comes down, it takes the entire area out. And we detected that through the uh, SAFI and SADI and, uh, and KD numbers that, you know, we monitor and we continuously tracking those to see where are the trouble spots. And we decided to upgrade that to the Hendrix, to the diamond-shaped construction. <coughs> the cables that you see, this is the most reliable system. So we're going to replace that and upgrade it. That's going to be $89,000. The next line is uh, 211.503 and 211.504 fiber line extension to substation 4. A national grid, they are, they're trying to connect uh, the, the 211 station and Woburn and go all the way to Tewksbury. So we are right in the middle. And in order to communicate with their SCADA, they need to beef up the line. So in order to beef up the line, we also they need to go through our substation and go on back up. Uh, and also the radial tap of the fiber communication to our substation so they connect our station load and our station uh, data into their uh, system, SCADA system. So the price that they gave us was really high. So we decided to do it on our own so we can go through the bidding process and see that, you know, maybe we save more money that way. So that's why we decided to say that, you know, okay, we're going to do it ourselves. We achieve the goal and we get it done, but we do it our way, not, you know, what you want to charge us. So <clears throat> just to make sure I understand, they need the fiber optic to connect to their system, but well, they're actually, no. us? They're, they're to, uh, that's a very good question. This is, uh, this is actually per NERC requirement as well as the NPCC. Ah. Okay, so we are mandated an ISO requirement. They need to monitor in order to manage the load on 115 kV loop. They need to see how much load the reading is drawing and how much no load is coming in and going out. So all of that data needs to be, you know, monitored for their system reliability. And we need to, we're obligated to do this. It, okay. this so is not it's our cost to basically put right. it in. That's our cost to put it in. And, you know, you know it, it, it's nice, you know, that's something that, you know, for the overall area regional reliability, mm -hmm. the rely NERC NPCC is, you know, asking, uh, and New England ISO, they want to know. Because when they call for, let's say, 5% voltage reduction, or when they call for load shedding, they want to know that actually the load has gone down. And, you know, immediately they need, in order to make the decisions how to manage the sure. load, system load on 115 kV. Yeah. So that's why we are doing, they are doing it. Okay, <clears throat> the next projects, you see the next uh, three projects, uh, line item number 24, 25, 26, 27. These are the getaways out of the station four. Part of the problem that, if you recall, uh, Booth and Associates, they detected, they said that, you know, all of these, con all of these cables that jammed into eight uh, duct bank, and they're all, every, uh, every conduit is filled, uh, and the heat builds up. As the heat builds up, it builds more resistance. It's going to drop the ampacity rating of the cable. So in order to raise that and bring it up to what it should be, we have either we need to take some of those out, out of the, uh, the duct bank and or build a new duct bank, so which is going to be very costly and expensive. So we did other engineers. They came up with a very creative way to take two of those lines out of the underground and put them on overhead directly out of the station without impacting the underground duct bank and improve the rating, reduce the heat. And that's a 4W5, 4W12 getaway improvement for $117,000. We're going to start the work, part of it in FY19, I mean, from uh, until December, 142 and 117000 in CY19. That's going to increase, actually incre increase the uh, distribution capacity by 20 megawatts which is good, and also the rating of the cables, which right now we can load them up more than 360 amps. That's going to bring it up to close to 400 mm. by doing that, which is win-win situation 
for us and you know it's achieving all of those line items that you know they wanted to replace the underground getaways 2000 mcm or double line that double up the line to cut down their resistance and increase the impacity which would have cost us you know over two million dollars in order to do that so this way it's much easier to do that and you know we only need to replace maybe one line from 750 mcm to 1000 mcm as opposed to double up the line and we don't have the duct in the room to do that anyway so you need to build up another duct bank which is going to be very very costly so this is really great savings for us <clears throat> the total project this total project for be between fy19 and fy is and cy19 it's going to cost 259 thousand dollars total uh, as opposed to spend, spending a million dollars for a new duct bank also, 157,000 for 4W6 and 206,000 for 4W16 in order to upgrade the cables, which these cables are old anyway. They need to be upgraded to 750 MCM copper, and you know that's going to increase the ratings even more, which is really great. This is good. This is definitely I feel very confident about you know spending this kind of money in order to uh, for the system to benefit, especially. Station four, which is the older after station five, is the older between three and four, than four, older substation. So we, we gain a lot. We get the more, more for what we're spending. The next one is uh, line item number 33, uh, AMI mesh network expansion, a meter replacement for $300,000. $300, you see that that's a continuing uh, expenditures until 2024. Because what we do, we got a number of meters, as you all been uh, hearing, uh, on the audit management system, uh, we got some meters that, you know, they don't have the capability, the ITRON meters. That's why we, we expanded the mesh network in, uh, in Eaton, the new system. They don't have the capability of reporting the last gasp to the audit management system. It's because, you know, they don't have the, the their multi-earth module that, you know, we can't just replace that module with the Ethan module to make them to join the mesh network. So uh, you have to replace the meter. You got about 3,600 meters between residentials, commercials, and, you know, and uh, uh, industrial that they're not going to be able to report back to the audit management system. So we need to spend the money now for two reasons. Number one, uh, bring more strength to the mesh network that, you know, the true mesh two-way communication between the meter and the outage management system and SCADA uh, and also replace the meters. So part of that money you see that being spent to, in, to install the relays that they can relay the, you know, the messages to, to, the, to and join and put, put bring more strength <coughs> to the backbone of the mesh network and also replacing the meters that we need to do in order to uh, again, uh, strengthen the mesh network as well as solve some of that problem that you know we we have right now, which we the only solution to that would be to replace them all. It's going to cost about eight, two million dollars, and you know we spread them over six years, so we should be able to manage that. Is there any market for used meters? I mean, maybe not. Not here, for the ones that we have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking maybe offshore someplace. <laughs> Could maybe I don't know. Maybe what we do once we take the meters out of the service, we put them uh, on uh, you know on the shelf for six months just in case there is any discrepancies and any, any problems with them, and then we go through them. You know, we sell them through the bidding process. Hmm. So everybody in the in the U.S. they're going to be notified that we got these meters. Anybody interested? But usually, you know, because, you know, the life of those meters are not more than, you know, eight to ten years. Mm. And uh, so they, okay. they're, they're old technology. They, they don't have any values. Put it this. Scrap metal. Yeah. yeah. But still we go through our, you know, bidding process for sure. that, even though those, those are scrap. Right. So yep. we do that. All right. So that's, so that's for that project. And I guess the last uh, two projects on sheet number three, you see the line item number 47. That's a Woburn Street, Wilmington, uh, between West Street and Concord Street. And this upgrade was really needed in order to uh, bring the opacity of the uh, feeder uh, in that area and, and meet the National Electric Safety Code clearances because that area was, you know, we had like two circuits on toothpicks, basically. And it was bad. So we needed to upgrade them. We set new poles, and you know the, the engineers they did a great job for 
uh, poll loading calculations as well as the design that, w- that was done. And now uh, that I feel confident about that, uh, that area, and that's a main uh, drag in order to uh, send the load toward Wilmington and, you know, relay the load between Reading and Wilmington. And, you know, that, that is a good, definitely, it was a good uh, move to make in order to make the improvements, reliability, for reliability reasons. Uh, also, project number 48, that's 115 kV transmission line pole upgrade. Uh, we did one pole in FY18, one, uh, that, uh, one line, the uh, 211503 line. Uh, as you recall, every year we test the poles, 10% of the poles system-wise, we, you know, we t- test them. The poles that we owned by us in our custodial area, which is like about 6,500, 6, we usually test between anywhere between 60, 650 to 700 poles. And that showed actually these lines, the both lines, that they, uh, some of the poles failed. So because these are the main feet to the substation four, so we decided, we said we're not taking any chances. We just want to upgrade them all, make sure everything is uh, in, intact and the system reliability is to the best it can be. So we did one line uh, in FY18, and the second line is being done next week. The contractor actually, it's there now. They're setting poles, and they're, they're uh, going to be pulling wires and getting that done next week and once we get that done then we are done with the two incoming lines from the ever source uh, which is going to be the most reliable and uh, and basically that concludes my presentation for the cy19 we are asking uh, seven million eight hundred and four thousand uh, dollars to spend to do all of those good projects that i explained to you all right. Thank you, Hamid, for that great thank you. presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just as an aside question, and you know, I'd like to just very short. Sure. Uh, Verizon owns half the poles on our territory. More. Uh, we've got about 16,800 poles, and Verizon owns like about 10,000. Right. And do they have their own crews, crews testing their poles or not? They're not. So they're not. So we've gotten really good at testing poles. Right? Yes. That's one of our core competencies exactly. as far as I can tell. Exactly. Is there any way we could sell that as a service to Verizon? For their poles, especially when they're going to be using 5G, so Colleen <laughs> shaking her head, going, <laughs> "No." We already asked; it's yeah. a union issue. So they're they're not. We interested. can test them for you know for safety if we want to. And it's not ownership; it's custodial. Each pole is owned 50/50, so they have a more custodial than we do. Mm-hmm. But from a union standpoint, we can't just perform that service for them. Um, we certainly can. So we own 50% of the pole, and they own 50% of the pole? Yes. Yeah, 50%. Uh, each pole. Ownership each is 50 pole in their yeah. territory? Pole. That's right. There's custodial areas. That. All the poles are owned by Verizon and RMLD together, each pole, 50-50. Custodial. Because the maps we saw before were very yeah. differentiated. That's that, custodial right. area. Custodial. Ah. So just because you own it, you split who's going to take care of the inside of the house and who's going to mow the lawn. You know what I mean? You've you right. got to split. So... They don't mow the lawn, though. Mm. They don't mow the lawn. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. They d- they do maintenance, but their their you know their inspection is quite different from our inspection. If they happen to have a work order on that pole, they'll take a look at yeah. it. But we're doing, you know, osmosis. Right. We're we're doing you know density. I, I'm tests. just thinking of it in terms of reference to the first thing we talked about, which was if they are going to move into 5G and need all these other additions to it, is there an opportunity for us to upsell? Our services. Well, you know, them. Verizon had come in. We talked about that, and then that discussion kind of went away, probably. And it happened in a couple of communities, but then the discussion stopped here because when the 5G was going to go in, they probably said, "Hmm, maybe we shouldn't be selling this asset." So, that I, I don't know if that's right. the that reason, but sense. it certainly makes sense. Yeah. We should have yeah, bought those poles. Why? <laughs> we should have bought those poles. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Depends <laughs> which half we own, the top of the bottom. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Other questions for him? That's all right. right, That's fine. But, you know, during the construction, if we are doing construction in their custodial area, if we need to, you know, upgrade and if we feel like, you know, that the pole is not going to make it because every single pole is being analyzed with the pole foreman for pole loading. Mm -hmm. And if it's not going to support it or there's a problem with it, we ask them to replace it if they're not testing it, you know. So. And they comply. And they comply. Excellent. They have to. Good. Right. Thank you. David? So, 
So this is, and I just wanted the last uh, part of the, in it, you see that in financials, you see that, you know, we're going for bond for 1.2 million in CY20 for Wilmington substation and 3.3 uh, 3 million uh, or 3 million 300 thousand dollars in CY20. And you see that, you know, for the forced account mass DOT, we getting <coughs> reimbursing, we being reimbursed for 225,000. So, and the, those, the other items you see, electric vehicle, EVSE, that, you know, $6,000 that we are hoping we can get from state uh, to fund the charging stations. So, basically, that's what it is. That's how we fund the money. And also, we, we're transferring money from the operating funds, obviously, you know. The combination of operating funds and also these uh, bond proceedings and the uh, the, the money that we get from the state reimbursements and the state, you know, these are all where the money is coming from that you see. Are we doing the bonding ourselves or are we <coughs> working through the town? No, we're, we're not absolutely sure we're bonding yet. This is, these are just placeholders. Ah, got uh, it. But we're going in April to discuss uh, the purchase of the land and we'll request for the bond uh, so that we can get that done. And then the bonding may or may not occur the following year, but you still have to go to a town meeting. So we want to get that over right. with and we'll provide a bond schedule. Right. And we just met with bond council. So we've got all the, uh, everything that we're supposed to put together in order to submit on time. So. Great, thank you. So this, I'm sorry, go ahead. You have questions? Well, when, when you're done. Yeah, this is, this is, I'm done. You're done. I'm waiting for the vote. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, all this is fantastic. Uh, my, my question is, is more about a couple of things at the beginning about our, our actual building site, the parking lot investments, the building. Those are the things that I just want to, you know, what are those and why do we need to do, you know, a quarter of a million on, on the parking lot? Um, those seem like the kind of things that maybe we could take and, you know, what are, what are our action points on those? I've never seen a, um, an image of the design and why we're doing it. I may have missed it. I think we had talked about that at one of the meetings and uh, mm -hmm. uh, about doing the parking lot uh, out here. Uh, and I can tell you tonight it was completely full out here and I almost right. ripped my bumper off. Uh, so I'm all for it. Sure, it's The, it's the it. parking lot has to be regraded anyways. Right. And right now, you know, you know, half of the potential lot is gravel and you can't right. park in it. So the design is is kind of like a feather you know you you pull in you pull out and then we're putting the charging stations there so when we had that conversation I think it was back when we were talking about the charging stations. so we have to regrade the parking lot anyways and resurface it you know it fills up with water uh, so it was better to just lay it out differently so you're not pulling into a mouse maze and we would double the amount of spaces that we have right I guess um, have we seen the site plan for this at one of these meetings I don't know if we've seen the site plan, no. So, I mean, I guess... Th there's a design that there was done, you know, but it's not the final design, so we're just going through that process of evaluation. And then how many charging stations? We have a double charging station out there. That is supposed to go in the front parking lot. That's where it's being relocated when you're the parking lot it. is fixed, correct. It's not adding, it's just relo you're relocating what's we're there now to a different spot. Correct, because that's the public one that we got the uh, grant uh, rebate on. Why does it have to be relocated? Um, well, we can leave that one there for. Uh, we we have another one out back for our electric car, and you know because originally it was supposed to go in in the customer parking lot. That's not a customer parking lot. Oh, we I actually see. had to move our, the uh, handicap down, and that's where the town trucks park. So we're just making do for right now until we resurface. So resurfacing that parking lot costs two thirty. Well, we have no because the whole parking lot is going to move right up against the antique building. Okay. Um, so that you can get all the spots. I guess the reason I'm asking is that we've had a lot of conversations about how we can yes. work with the town and what the site and the overall zone is going to be doing vis-a-vis -vis redevelopment, and it just raises questions. I mean, it makes me wonder. Well, how does this fit in with some larger plan? And and if it does, and what is the larger plan? How does this quarter of a million fit in with a larger site review of this whole industrial zone? That's why I'm asking. Um, you know. Yeah. No, that makes well, makes if, a, if a lot a of sense. If there's a redevelopment happening in the next decade, I, I I would say that that would involve these pieces, this building, you know, that empty lot, which is the parking lot, the 
We, we just physically don't have enough parking. Right. Because we're not in full compliance of our security under NERC either. No one is supposed to be parking on the other side of the fence. So, and we don't own this driveway or anything out the back. It's all owned by a third party who allows us to park some of our cars there, but that's only on a temporary basis. So we just physically don't have enough spots in this building. So we are very careful that we're not spending any money on a building or anything like that that yeah. could be under an economic development That's what I'm saying. Thing. I mean, if this site, is th if this is going to be redeveloped and somehow in the next 10 years or 15 years even, to expend 250 to redo a parking lot when we don't know what the larger picture is, is, is what I'm raising. Yeah, but ten, 10 years is a lifetime. I mean, 10 years, uh, ten year, I mean, I, you know, I, redevelopment, I mean, I, I, I've been old. <laughs> so I yeah. remember 10 years ago, the yeah. redevelopment committee going, yeah, we should be doing something here, and nothing happened for a decade. No, I know. So I'm not sure we should wait another decade to improve our our thing here. Besides which, we all want that old antique building to be a Starbucks. So I'm thinking <laughs> the parking uh, Mr. Chair, may I? Seriously. Yes, so, may. Um, so I mean, I think the answer is somewhere in the middle or the left or right, because I think 10 years, just we probably wouldn't wait that long for a decision if we knew something was happening. But maybe the really the question is, uh, because the, the main focus tonight is approval of the budget. It sounds to me prudent to have that money in the budget. That doesn't mean it's going to be spent tomorrow. Exactly. And maybe Good what point. Dave is asking is if there's a design or it may be right. useful to see what the layout looks like before they start digging up the parking lot. And because uh, I think what you said, Colleen, I think when you see what it looks like, it may make a, the other reality, as I know from our own company, repaving it's like roofs and repaving your 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 uh it's, it's not like your driveway <laughs> you know it's a much bigger it, they cost a lot of money it's yeah. you know it's it's, it's a lot yeah. of it's I a lot I of don't dough, disagree. which i think is what dave's and, saying and but dave I, if you know something from the redevelopment committee yeah. that's going on in town i'd love to hear it i i haven't seen anything that's all but it sounds like you bring up a good point tom we'll have another chance to yes. look at this before yeah, i mean i would i would say let's I'm, keep I'm, the to be clear, I'm not suggesting any action about the budget here. I know we're, I mean, in the capital budget, huh. yes, it'll go through, no question. But do we then have another moment to like to approve or, or modify that that line item? And what will that be? Or, or in, in approving this, does it just happen at the staff level? Well, generally, when you approve things, it yeah. just happens. So if, if you want to say it's approved contingent on seeing the design, but you're asking for a design where I'm asking to do the design this year. So right. I can show you what the conceptual looks yeah, like. You actually approved the parking lot design a couple of years ago. And what happened is when we hired the engineering company to come in, the drainage system was all, the whole thing was just a complete mess. You have load centers that are electrical boxes that go over to the old station. Yep. So the whole thing had to be redone, new right. drainage, if, if, it, if we read in, on the estimate, it says um, you have uh, ten thousand dollars on the engineering to develop the construction documents, and then uh, reconfigure customer parking lot, install new drainage system, asphalt curbing, stri uh, striping, and landscaping, and install you got to install the EV. Okay. All right. So what you're saying is, when we approve the budget, it, it'll just happen. There's not a further review or approval step for us to look at this. Yes or no? Typically, when you approve the budget for that project, we don't stop and come back and get permission. But I, we can, you can do whatever you want. Well, I guess, I've, look, I guess to me, it's like you're only looking at one little part. Of, like, we don't know what the larger site usage might be, you know, in the next few or 10 or more years. What's going to happen to the, the building on the other side of uh, Station 1? What's going to happen to Station 1? Is this building going to get reused? But we're going to spend a quarter of a million dollars on this little postage stamp. To me, it seems like we sh we shouldn't until we know what the larger, if any, plan is of the, the site and the block and the, the buildings around it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's one certainly w one good thought. Yeah. And um, I think, but the flip side of that is that you make an improvement to the property, it's yeah. going to be valuable. Yeah, I mean, we saw this happen in downtown Reading, where somebody wanted a parking lot for a specific. The need that they thought they wanted. This was the bank on Sanborn Street. They fought like hell for ten uh, for a long time to get this. They got it on the argument that they needed it because they would move out otherwise, and they ended up moving their administrative offices anyway. 
parking lot's going to get redeveloped. It was all this effort and hundreds of thousands of dollars and wasted time and effort to solve a problem that wasn't really a problem. So I, I watched that process at close range. I mean, I just, I, I'm skeptical of it. I guess that's all I'm saying. I'm concerned about, you know, repairing the entire roof. I mean, we've been waiting five years for some kind of economic development, and, you know, I committed to the board that we would only address major maintenance, but we, you know, this, the ceiling is leaking in everyone's office. Yeah, I mean, roofs so is, 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 is not roofs a roof. Are very ex no, but they're very expensive, and, and if you may tear this building down under an economic development, we certainly don't want to even do that. So, um... Well, I think the, the analogy isn't quite... This isn't doesn't quite fit but I, I've made my I've said my, my yeah. piece on it I, I'd like to see wider engagement with the town I'd like to know what the master plan is for this block before we spend a quarter million dollars on, on just a piece of, of, of a parking lot um, I don't I've never had a problem finding a space there I don't know what the pressing need is for additional spaces on a day-to-day -day basis if there's been a study or a, something on that that shows people lining up and parking on the street I don't know I think we move on. Need yeah, to move, move on, on to the vote. Yeah, yeah. Can I just? I mean, I, I think, in, in sometimes the answer is <clears throat> they don't know. In which case, that's an answer too, right? But it might be worthwhile between now and uh, it doesn't sound like anything is going to happen in the next thirty days, or is it coming in terms of? They're not going to dig well, up like I said, the parking lot was already approved a couple yeah, of budgets yeah. ago, yeah. and. Uh, and you know yep. we had to take it to the town and, and that particular design was okay but it got yeah. rejected because it wasn't meeting the objective of a sufficient amount of spaces yeah. so that we would move our cars off of private property yeah. so we needed more spaces um, so it, it was redeveloped yeah. and we have a conceptual but we haven't moved forward with yeah. anything well, I, I think we could approve the budget and then just ask for as you're starting to move forward with that just to on whatever that month is, that board meeting that you just bring back that to yeah, us. Yeah, we can show it to you. If you don't yeah. want to do it, we'll, yeah. well, we ask for it. We can have the facilities guy come in. He can talk about the drainage issues and all the things that, whether they can last 10 years or whatever. I yeah, so I guess we're just yeah, asking. I mean, you're asking, like, well, you want to be involved in that process a little bit more. A little, yeah. yeah. And, and, and to know whether it, it plugs into anything else that's happening as far as a redevelopment or a vision for the redevelopment of the larger yeah, the site I, of which we are a part. Yeah, I mean, I think the other point at, to Dave's point is because I think you're part of the, some development committee, aren't you, Colleen? Well, the economic develop development conceptuals that the MCAP um, Forget about that. Community, that. That's a dead process. Okay, but the, yeah. the drawings that they showed, yeah. nothing that I ever saw showed the historic building being ripped down. So this is just improving the parking lot right in front of that building. So since that's never going to get shut down, and if it turns into condos or whatever it is, restaurant, there's nothing with this this parking Sorry. lot that it would be impacted other than to serve an exist, you know, a building that's staying. So yeah, unless unless this, the site itself was to have some construction on it, the the what's now a parking lot, that that sometimes happens. I mean, the the, the lot that I mentioned on Sanborn Street is is in fact going to be part of a of a development project in the next uh, few years connected to the post office. Okay. So, well, I guess we can you know, vote and just request yeah. that you know, we're in dialogue with you on, yep. on those steps. Okay. Somebody want to read the motion? Where's the motion? Uh, just a are we uh, just a point of order? So are we approving this in pieces or the whole budget? Or this is just the capital budget, right? This is the capital budget. Yeah, right. but I mean now we're gonna so we're gonna do it to two separate approvals. Right. Okay. Sure. Uh, move that the RMLD Board of Commissioners approve the calendar year 2019. Capital budget in the amount of seven million eight hundred and four thousand three hundred and seventy three dollars as presented on the recommendation of the general manager. A second. Second. All right. Discussion? I guess we had that. I guess we had it. All those in favor? Motion carries four zero zero and um, last week the cab voted four zero zero to approve that. Capital budget as well. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think we have uh, Ms. Markowitz coming up to talk about the operating budget next. It's budgeting season.
handouts oh, at this point. Yes, you, you have, have two handouts. You know, Eleven by seven. No, I do not. I'm sorry. Oh, right. So uh, let's let's focus on the uh, actual presentation handout first, and then we'll do a little bit of the financials after that. Okay. So I'm here to present the uh, calendar year 19 operating budget. Just a couple of uh, brief highlights about the budget. The uh, fixed costs represent 80.7% of the overall operating budget, of which 71.44% is power supply. The fixed cost decreased by about 4.26% from FY19's budget to CY19, uh, due mainly to a reduction in power supply costs, specifically fuel. Did you want to say anything about that, Jane? No, it was an estimate at the time. Fuel is passed through. And so um, based on current projections, um, capacity comes down a little, um, transmission went up a little, but there was a significant decrease in estimated fuel. Hmm. OK. So Thank you. Uh, Wendy, I must be, so where does, uh, I mean, labor is obviously a big component of the budget, right? Yeah, you're going to see You're going to see the whole thing. I just wanted to okay, give you a is couple. That in the, you said fixed costs. I mean, that's fixed labor. Co uh, fixed costs are not labor. Labor is not in the fixed costs. Labor is in semi variable. Oh, okay. Fixed costs are the power oh, supply costs. Yeah, okay, I got you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. So the semi variable costs, to answer your question, Tom, represent about 19.3% of the overall operating budget. And the increase in semi variable costs from FY19 to CY19 is about 2.6% overall. Uh, the overall operating budget is projected to decrease by about 2.94%. Uh, from FY19 to CY19. And now we can go over this, this spreadsheet of the actual numbers. So the fixed cost versus the semi-variable costs, um, I know everyone likes to see this because it's, it pretty much puts it all into perspective very quickly. So as you can see quickly, the top piece of the um, spreadsheet shows exactly the um, their purchase power, fuel, capacity, and transmission costs which I mentioned were 71.44% of the budget. And then you have your depreciation expense at a rate of 3% is um, 4,524,000, which is 4.83% of the budget. You have your um, payment to the town of Reading of $2.48 million, which is 2.65% of the budget. Then you have your four town payments, which is based on the 2% of net plant which is about $1.6 million, 1.68% uh, of the budget. And then we have uh, disposal of losses on equipment, about $100,000. And then down below, you have your semi-variable costs. And I'll just go over the, the, uh, the high ticket items, if you will. Labor is about 7.12% of the budget. Your employee benefits and your pension expense is 3.83% of the budget. Then you have your operating and maintenance expenses, most, the majority of those, 2.76% of the budget. Conservation expenses, 1.05% of the budget. Then you have some overtime to get the projects done in a timely manner, another 1.06% of the budget. And then um, tree trimming comes in almost at 1% of the budget. And then everything else below that is less than half a percent of the budget, most, mostly less than half percent of the budget. So those are all your, your high level items that take up the majority of the entire budget. Anybody have a question on any specific line item there? Yeah, I have one, Wendy. Sure. Um, the employee benefits and pension. Yes. Is that percentage, is that continually going up? Can you give us a sense of each year what that goes up? Sure. So um, in there, you have your health insurance costs, of course, mm -hmm. and that has been going up. Mm -hmm. um, some years pretty hefty, and then other years uh, it seems like it's going to go up, and then we're getting some credits as well, so it's not going up as drastically. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the exact percentage of what that ex specifically is going up. But then you have your pension costs, which is basically an obligation that we have to pay to support the pension system, and that is going up, um, I believe, about $400,000 a year at this, at, at this point. It goes up four hundred grand. Yeah, it's a year. going up very rapidly right now. Okay, because we're trying to reach a particular, we're trying to reach a particular, based on the actuarial, re, actuarial reports, the town of Reading as a whole is trying to reach a specific time to be fully funded. Now, whether or not that's going to happen or not, but those we are the obligations. I thought we were much obligations. better funded than the town of Reading. I mean, oh, no, we are, but the obligation 
continues to increase based on what the actuarial report says and the timeline of everyone retiring but it and their lifespan and everything good, else. Good point. Um, but it's also heavily based on what future payments are per interest, right, whatever the interest is. So with interest rate going up, the pension obligations should be coming down, actually. Actually, the OPEB is going to be coming down. The pension's going up. Pensions going up. Yes, but the OPEB you will see in the next Reduction few years, it will start to come down. Right. And the OPEB is the other post-employment benefits, so that's the health insurance to hmm. um, employees who've retired. Hmm. That's interesting. Yes. Okay, I would have thought it was the pension. Be because of the well. way it's being, uh, because of the funding status of it and where we stand with it and how much we need to put into it in order to continue to meet our obligation. Right. Okay. We can do it. That makes sense. It, it does. Uh, <clears throat> although I've, I've dealt with this in other commercial companies, and and the pension obligations are large, and they were growing because the interest rates were so low and dropping. Right. So it meant that all the accumulated um, monies uh, growth of those funds would not meet the obligation in the future years. Right. right? And right. even though they are, this, so these actuar actuarial reports are stating a higher interest rate. I want to say between six and eight percent. We're wow. not getting that kind of return Nobody on our gets money. 6 to 8%. But that is what the reports are showing. Yeah. That's what they're estimating the value hmm. of the money on. You know, we questioned that. Remember we did. And we've been in, I, I we, we've that. had some discussions with the town to talk about trying to figure out how we can better uh, invest our funds. Uh, but at this moment, there's, there's no movement. That doesn't say we can't do a better job together to, to uh, yeah. well, I mean, you try also, to figure this out. You can't. You can't put them in, in all, in all uh, yeah, <laughs> stocks, <laughs> and you, know, you lose half your half the money, like yeah. 2009. Okay. Yep. I, I have one other question, Wendy. Yes. Uh, on the overtime. Yes. I noticed we budgeted almost a million dollars last year, and it came in like eighty thousand dollars less. I'm surprised because we had those big storms. Why is was that captured in these numbers? Um, so we budgeted. So on the left-hand side, we budgeted seven hundred and sixty-three thousand, and we came in oh. at eight ninety-four. Oh, okay. So, it so was there's over. your actual. Yes. Oh, it's the next year that was up. Okay, the next year was. The FY nineteen budget was up. Yes. Right. So right. I'm uh, sorry, I misread that. And that all depends as well on capital versus operating projects. So if you have more capital. Not just storms. It's also no right exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide. So I just wanted to give you a um, high-level picture of what the six-year plan shows. So on this slide, we are looking at budgeted net income as compared to budgeted rate of return for the six-year plan. So as you can see, the, the net income amount is on the top of the blue line, and you can see how it correlates to our rate of return. We discussed uh, staying close to the 8% um, rate of return in order to fund capital projects. And as we are feeling that the um, the system is more safe and reliable, and we don't need to spend as much money. We believe that it's responsible to bring that rate of return down, and we're going to try to stay around uh, the six, stay above the six percent mark. Okay, so that just shows that. The next slide shows you the budgeted kilowatt hours sold as compared to the budgeted rate of return. So um, we've been projecting that it's going that the kilowatt hour sales are going to come in at a decrease of one percent each year. So you can see that trend as, as we see that it's going to happen. Also, in how it relates to the rate of return. So as it's coming down, the rate of return is also coming down. And the last slide um, talks about what Hamid was talking about: how the capital funds uh, basically where we get the money for the capital funds. So you look at the blue portion of, of the bar, and that's the beginning balance that we start the year off with. So you see the first year is 6.5 million. The reason it's so high is because we anticipating, uh, we're getting ready for building the new substation, so we wanna make sure we have the funds in a timely manner. Because even though you see the orange portion of your depreciation fund, again, at the rate of 3%, is um, a healthy, number 4.5 million we we don't take the 4.5 million right at the beginning of the year we spread that out over 12 months so you so if you would come in the in the year with zero you you have no money to start your capital projects so that just doesn't seem reasonable 
So that's why we start with a balance, basically knowing what, what kind of projects we're coming in at. And um, then you have your depreciation fund that is strictly reserved for capital projects. And then we try to make a determination on, uh, based on the net income and the amount of money left over, what we can afford to put into capital projects from the operating fund. And then your yellow portion shows what we are um, contemplating as uh, bond, uh, bond, sorry, bond proceeds. And some of that is a uh, small portion of that is interest, ex uh, interest income as well. And your forced accounts, of course, when you get uh, a job from the state of Massachusetts. So the green bar next to it shows what the anticipated capital improvements will be based on Hamid's um, budget. So you can see that we are continuously, um, we're continuously investing in the system at a rate higher than the depreciation rate, which is the orange, which is why the need for continuing to transfer money from the operating fund. Okay. So that concludes the actual presentation, but I would like to take a minute to go over the financials. So you have another handout in front of you. Yeah, Wendy, just a question. Oh, yes. So, so what happens, like in CY19, we have the 6.573 and the 4.524. So those really in, in total are available for capital? Yes, they are. So, what, so that top number that, that in red, the $12.3 million, yeah. yes, that's ready for the, that, that money is ready. Yeah. But we're budgeting. At the end of the 12 months, though, yeah, We're Tom. budgeting 7.8. So what happens to the difference? It sits there. It's just your regular checkbook for capital projects only. Yeah, in case so, we exceed the budget. Right, and also for timing differences. Yeah. Like I said, the, the orange portion, it's spread over 12 right. months. You're not getting the 4.5 immediately. You're getting a 12th of it every month. Right. The, the other thing I think that Colleen pointed out in uh, the paper was that should we have a, a – uh, Catastrophic. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a substation blows up or yeah, something happens to it. Yeah. It's a huge expense. Yeah. So you need to have something left over to yeah, yeah. have a safety oh, factor. Yeah. Right. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And the timing of the, the first year, Tom, because of the, you have to remember we're switching from a fiscal year to a calendar year. The timing of that also. Right. Um, because we had already put in the funds on July 1 to start this capital projects. Right. So. That also is, is a little bit skewing the numbers there. Can I add something? Yes. When you look at the capital, uh, the depreciation fund, though, at the end of the six years, you see that it goes down to $1.9 million. So Wendy and I have gone back and forth as far as what is the minimum balance that you leave in that depreciation fund. So $2 million isn't really going to cover a, a catastrophe, but that, along with some other accounts, you might be able to pull it together. Mm -hmm. yes. We don't want to leave too much money in there, so we kind of said no less than $2 million uh, would be reasonable because, yes. again, the next year that you start, you, you're going to be putting in your depreciation expense in 12 payments. So... Um, Right. So that's your comfort cushion of $2 million. You always well, want to be Well, that's where we are right now because, again, sales are coming down and we're talking about the town payment and we've we got a lot of balls in the air. So, you know, I think we both feel a little bit more comfortable with a little bit higher, but, you know, we've been transferring in and we're, we also would rather not bond. We have those placeholders, but we're, we're trying to make it all work. So, um, okay. Mm. All right. Okay. Yep. All right, so I just wanted to go over the financials uh, for a minute. Unfortunately, we haven't had um, the audited presentation of the uh, fiscal year 18 financials yet. We are waiting for the actuarial, re actuarial report based on the new GASB uh, for the OPEB to bring the OPEB on the books, and the auditors are not comfortable um, doing a presentation without everything in front of them, which, no. which, means <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. No? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the numbers, the FY18 actual numbers should not change, uh, and we got these right before the budget went out, so that's all I had for information at the time, so I do not have any updates on July and August uh, numbers at this time, but for FY18 actual, we came in at uh, $5.2 million, but I just want to let you know that that's a little misleading. We really came in with a real Net income of 4.5, but because of this OPEB, about a $700,000 uh, 
decrease in expenses was part of the calculation. Okay, so I just want to let you know that. So the rate of return came in under 8%. Um, and luckily, even though we had those three storms, uh, luckily but not really because we're still understaffed and, and we have a lot of vacancies, but we did come under budget. I mean, we were pretty flat throughout the, the whole time, even though I didn't think we were going to be. So, okay, I just want to... Clarify so that. how are we able to do it with all those storms and still come under budget? Well, we have a vacancy. I mean, we have a lot of vacancies, as we've discussed, and, um, you know, we're Vacan vacancy. Vacan uh, employees, we, we a lot oh, of oh, positions yeah. right. okay, that are not yeah. filled at this time. Right, so they were budgeted, but we didn't have to, right. we didn't have those. Right, so you, you have, you know, people working harder. <laughs> yeah, right. Got it. <laughs> okay, so, um, and then if you look at... Um, so the, the overall budget, total operating revenues of $96 million, as, uh, as I said, reduced by about $3 million from FY19. And then you have your purchase power capacity uh, and transmission and fuel costs of $66.8 million. <coughs> and then your bottom line number, we're anticipating coming in at $3.5 million. And that's what we're asking for your vote on. The second page just shows you um, just a comparison from what we presented in March for the FY19 budget uh, as compared to the CY19 budget as we're presenting right now. So I just wanted to have that in front of you so that way you could see it clearly. So we are asking for uh, a total net income of $3,529,582 and we are not raising rates in order to make that net income All right. this time. Hmm. Okay. Any Good. other questions for Wendy? Uh, I guess this is more for just future discussion. So the, uh, this slide is pretty uh, revealing mm. in terms of. It is, yep. Uh, and, and I know we'll talk about it in another while, another topic, but I think as the board and as the uh, staff, it'd be important you know, because in a business, John, you have a lot of experience with this, you, you'll sometimes forecast a decline in sales for a given year or something, but, you know, we're sort of, and, and safely, we're sort of projecting this, is, but as an ongoing economic model, <laughs> you know, we need to think about the implications of that long term. Right. So if it, <laughs> over a long enough stretch, like 1% a year decline, <laughs> I think we all know what that means, right? Right. Uh, and it looks very systemic, right? I mean, it's happening over a yeah, long period of time. Yeah, and, and we don't, not and, going and to I think Colleen is point. I mean, there's other things we don't know about economic development, but I guess it, and Dave has sounded the horn a, a bunch of times. I think we need to revisit some of the early discussions around on the strategy around, you know, income opportunities. And I know, Colleen, you've, you've already brought in some thoughts on that with presenters, but how do we, you know, offset, because it, it's like the, company that you know loses a, a plant or two or ten in their region right you still you, you eventually have to replace that with other business or right companies invent new pro I mean there's things that every business does to to be sustainable it's really about sustainability right absolutely and unfortunately a lot of the improvements that are going on in our business have a reduce our revenue right because they're more efficiency efficient. sure so right. and then it seems to be our charter too is to help our customers reduce their cost yeah and that's but, the, but that's at such yeah. a difficult um, yeah. juncture with the yeah. fact that we're also a fixed cost yeah. organization. Well, and, and that's why in some businesses they have fixed fee agreements because you basically are paying the same amount of money to make a customer more efficient, right? But in this case, we're not getting any more revenue for providing more efficiency or any more benefit. Mm. Uh, profit. So, uh, and, we're not, and we're not the only ones. A lot of Munis like us are facing the same thing. Yeah, most, yeah, most yeah, yeah. Which is another good point. I, I think we may, we may want to listen to what they're doing, and because uh, everyone's going to have to deal with it. This is not a, you know, this is not a good. I mean, if you were doing your consulting, John, you'd recommend some, some new strategies, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and it also depends on what your bottom line looks like and what you're chartered to do. I mean, as a yeah. for-profit corporation, yeah. you know, you might be able to put in cost reduction efforts or invest in automation or do yeah. other things that yeah. could help, but yeah. this yeah. is not that, that case. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. But yeah, thanks, Wendy. For good. You're welcome. Thank you. Anything else? All set. Oh, Thank do you. we need to read the motion here? Yeah, go ahead. I can do that. Uh, are we allowed to ask any more questions? Yes. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Well, yep, we're going to go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, Wendy. Oh, yes, sir. Dave. Mm -hmm. And Phil might have a couple of questions, too. I don't know if you have a chance to look at it. Phil, any questions on what was presented? No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. You could probably look at it. <laughs> did I miss You did could I miss probably any? read that real quickly. Did I miss anything? <laughs> no. Go ahead, Dave. No, nothing of any significance. I got it. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm just wondering about some of these line items. Like oh, sure. If, if uh, employee benefits pension was 4900 Maybe, maybe you explained it. I just missed it. And now it's 3,700. If it was 2,900 actual fiscal 18 and budgeting, sorry, 2.9 and budgeting 3.7, that's a, a, a large increase. Oh, can I tell you why? Yeah, you might have okay. already done it. And I yeah, that's okay. Uh, what happened was, uh, you may not remember, yeah. on the financials, we had an underfunded okay, uh, OPEB. Okay. We were just trying to play catch up there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Labor again is going up 400,000. Is that just that looks like about a seven percent increase? That uh, okay, once again, yep. um, the operating budget and the capital budget together have your labor, and it depends on what portion of uh, uh, how much capital, how many capital projects we have versus operating. So when we presented the FY19 um, budget, Hamid was anticipating a higher cost of capital projects. And now with the CY19 budget, I got he's it. actually not just salaries. That's, no, that's, okay. so it's it depends on what portion goes to capital and which portion stays in the operating. One thing that, and I think Phil, not to put you on the spot, but I think you've asked about this in, in the past, is we're spending more than a half a million dollars on lawyers every year. Um, you know, is there a way to, to to cut down on how much we're spending on lawyers? You see a little bit of increase this year because uh, it is a negotiating year. So we wanted to make sure to be prepared for that. It's a half a million dollars that, what, Maybe 547 that. was actually spent and we budgeted 471. I mean, those are just very large numbers. And I, I come in and see um, very large invoices. And I know we all do. And yes. I just, do we have a policy around? I, b I believe Colleen has uh, mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that w when we re revisited all the policies, yep. that's where a large chunk of the money, and also this year we had that's some... That's what I meant. I meant oh. that we as a board maybe should set some policies about our oversight okay. on, on legal expenses, and, and that's what I mean. Not, okay. Yes, mm -hmm. but I know one thing we spent a lot of money on was having our policies edited and reviewed. Yes, and also the power contracts. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and we had uh, a white paper written, which I think uh, was to all of our benefit. Yes. Tremendous uh, impact, as a matter of fact. Um, and I think we used to spend in years past significantly more than what we're spending today. Yeah, I don't have a frame of reference for this. I mean, like, yeah. what does a town spend on, on lawyers and what does an average That's community utility spend on lawyers? <laughs> Can, can't, no, but you, no you also idea. can't compare us to the town. I mean, it's all a different animal mm. here as to what they're dealing with, what we're dealing okay. with here. All right. Yeah, so and I, I and think that's an unfair comparison. I'm not, well, I'm, it's, I'm not, if it's yeah. fair or unfair, I just I, I look at half a million dollars in lawyers, and I'm just, I'm Dave, just asking the question. If I may, I mean, it's fair in the sense that you value a legal opinion, and if the legal opinion um, doesn't work for you, then you could be in you know in line for a multi-million dollar suit, which the right. town was. So. I'm all for hiring very okay. competent attorneys for whatever purpose. So can I make a suggestion on a non-urgent yeah. basis? Because I'm sure things are busy. So what I'm hearing, I think there's two, when we look at our budget, so there's two issues. One is the size of the bucket. And you know, I think it would be worthwhile, you know, again, not urgently, but to look and maybe do just a five-year look back to see what the trend has yep. been. So it's been going down every year. That would suggest, you know, improvements are being made, and maybe look at uh, just parade of what the expenses are. So clearly, yeah. you know, with union negotiations, uh, that's if that's X percent of the pie, and then if there's only three or four sure. buckets. I'm sure okay. the policy yeah. that and a and to Dave's point, I I think looking at what comparably sized systems spend, uh, I think would be a r rational thing to do. I, mean, I, I I do think having three unions here and the sort of uh, issues that we've faced around the, all the negotiations yeah. um, perhaps has caused uh, more than uh, 
more than the normal amount of of, uh, of uh, uh, hours needed by the attorneys. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I suspect that's the case. But I, yeah. but I agree with you, Dave. I, th I think it's a good thing to look at. Yeah, yeah. get we some context. We don't, yeah. we don't have an in-house council, right? Because the, the towns sometimes have a, t a town staff member. Right. Or, it's yeah. very difficult. Right. We don't retain someone because we use uh, different special yeah. specialists. Yeah. We have labor mm -hmm. council. We have po power supply and FERC uh, council, um, you know, to protect us against yeah. millions and millions of dollars worth of right. suits. Um, and we have, you know, regular council that helps us with policies. Um, you know, so I, I'm more than happy to put together a spreadsheet explaining where it's going. I mean, mm -hmm. I came, we actually have that. Yeah, when I came, labor council yeah. was seven hundred and eighty dollars an hour, and I get it down to three hundred. Oh, no, that's great. So oh, I may okay. be doing five times as much work as was being done before, and maybe the bill might be still the same, but you're getting five times more the work because we're addressing. You, we were paying double. We were paying seven hundred and eighty dollars an hour. Yes. For the labor lawyer. For yes. The yes. One labor I council. That. Yes. So, so that's I the got high it, end of yeah. legal. Fees. So I got it down to less than half, and then I tripled the work for the same price. So I'm more than happy to put it together, and no one can call an attorney in this building unless they talk to me. So yeah, which is also very good policy. You know, mm -hmm. so you know, when you come in and and you're looking at a bill where we are, you know, <coughs> in a uh, a legal dispute with many many other utilities, and we are. You know, asking um, testimony to come in and people to, we have to pay our share of people coming in for testimony. It's it's kind of out of a control. But what does happen is all of the utilities that said they would share a particular cost that we agreed to, and the lawyer in charge starts to go over. Trust me that he's getting a million emails that he's going over, and we're all complaining. Hey, you said it was going to be this, and now it's starting to creep up. So then he has to let us know why. Duncan and Allen. Well, I'm, I'm giving as an example. It's not just Duncan Allen. It, it happens more than that. But that might be a particular example where we're splitting a lawyer's free, maybe ten ways, uh, and he gives us an estimate, and the lawsuit goes a little bit longer, or it's a little bit bigger, or they have testimonial comes in, and you know they're trying to win. But yeah, we may pay fifty thousand dollars for that legal fee, but the loss is two point eight million right. for just reading. So. You know, that's what I'm saying. I'll be glad to write down the categories and what the alternative is, because uh, setting a policy or guide or anything more than what I'm already doing operating-wise for our legal would really, you really would need to know the alternative measure before we get too much in, in constraining me operationally for yeah, that. looking to constrain. Yeah. I guess, I mean, one of our roles is, is to ask these questions. Yes. So it should be okay to ask the question. Oh, it yeah. is. It's no, a good I, idea to ask the question. Yeah. 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 I came in on a Saturday it. and I saw a guy paid $52,000, one guy, a consultant in Colorado, $52,000 for two weeks of work. I questioned it and it comes back on the board book as a question about legal fees. My actual question was not put in the board book. So I don't know, you know, when are we, what is the level at which we ask questions and get answers and understand these kind of enormous bills that come through? But Dave, we do have a spreadsheet. If you would like the breakdown of the legal costs, we'd be happy to give that to you. Yeah. And I think the questions are great. And I'm, I, I said I would put together a chart and explain it. I was only speaking to what you said originally, yep. what we need a board policy to control this. And I'm saying before you set those type of parameters, let me explain to you over historically what's been happening with legal fees and where we are. You may not find that it's, uh, you know, that it's out of control, that, it, that it's very much. Why don't we, we add something to the agenda on November about yeah. the question thing, about how we ask questions and how we get those answers? Yeah, that's a related, a related matter is, so we have this process where we come in and look at the AP warrant, right? It's built into what, what we do. Like we have a few things that we do. Okay, so we ask a question, but like the question that we ask is never publicized and the answer that we get is never like made public. Well, oh, my didn't question wasn't I was wasn't. In a car accident the day after, okay. so that was my fault. I apologize for that. Yeah, no, you didn't well, I, sign, correct? Well, I did sign it, but I, I put it. I put my question in email, so. Um, okay, I can forward it's that. It's okay. I mean. No. Yeah, no, I will say, Dave, I, I agree with your concern, if uh, the, the process, but 
I've questioned different items uh, on the, both the, the warrant, you know, the, the payables and the uh, salaries, and uh, they get answered, uh, you know, and if, okay. and if it's not a complete answer, I think Yeah, you were, you were more like, we want a shared answer, is that what you're saying? You want to... Uh, I always... Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah, no, it is. Yeah. So and question. you get the, and then this is the answer. Yeah. The question I asked was in an email, it wasn't shared with the other commissioners. Yeah. It's, also it's not in the board book, and I don't have the answer. So, and now I'm asking about this. It's okay. We can move on. You know. I I don't have a problem All answering right. any questions. Yeah. Good but news. let's but let's put on the November agenda. We can put uh, on the yeah. let's cover a little bit more in November. Sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because I mean, maybe we should talk, uh, revisit the process of how we sign that warrant anyway again, and how we raise questions on that warrant. Yeah. So that'd be good. fine with me. Yeah. Right. Can I do the motion? Sure. Would you? Move that the RMLD Board of Commissioners approve the calendar year 2019 operating budget with a net income of $3,529,582 as presented on the recommendation of the general manager. Okay. Second? Second. All right. All the uh, discussion? We had a lot of discussion. All those in favor? Mr. Chair, I will abstain because I was not present for the full discussion, even though I, I approved the budget. You're an honorable man. <laughs> yes. Okay. Even though I even though I read the budget and approved it, it's I was not here for Wendy's four to zero to one. scintillating dis uh, presentation. <laughs> I do it Chair, <laughs> thank you. May I make a thank you, Wendy? Just for the uh, for the records for next year, the, the re I knew there was a reason. So it's just a point of emphasis. So the reason I think the, you know, we've combined into one day. I think it's better to uh, present both the capex budget first and then the operating budget and then approve it once because if this didn't happen if we were having issues with the operating budget it might impact the need to pull money out of the mm. capex and have to so do them as a, a yeah well, i think a what tandem. you do we do it sort of a town meeting so you we approve the school we we tentatively approve in the sense of answer all the questions so any more questions no then we lay it aside so everybody and then, and then do at both the of end, you can All do right. both. But do you know what I mean? Because if you sure. if you have an issue with the, the operating budget, you, you don't have any way to, to you know, because they, they're related, right? You can right. cut back on some of the... There's an overlap, right. Yeah, you could reduce your CapEx, but you've already approved the CapEx, which I, I guess you could undo, but yeah. so I okay. just think it's a more efficient. All right, we'll do that from now on. Just a suggestion, friendly suggestion. No, I think, it's a gr I think we should enact it. Excellent. And um, the cab... Also voted 4-0 to recommend the operating budget. Well, then that makes it even a better decision. It is. It's solid. <laughs> and now for the very last time. Okay, may I ask? Oh, yes. You. Just to make sure that I got the action items. So on the November, we oh, yeah. want to put on an agenda AP process. And then you want a presentation of the legal fee explanation and the parking lot conceptual. Yes. Things. I mean, the parking lot one doesn't have to be next month. I think what you were saying, Dave, is just as we get closer to yeah, action on that to well, involve us together. It's, it's but already it's been going because, we're, again, we're, we're, we've skipped to a calendar year budget, so we're already halfway. You know, we, yes. So, because yes. Because it was approved a couple of years ago. So I don't want to spend any more money on it. So I'd rather bring in the conceptual of where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. Take a look at it. Great. That's perfect. Um, are all three of those doable for November? I mean, I, I know. Do we have a lot of other stuff on the agenda for November? Probably not. So I think that's is that manageable for you, Kyle? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Great. And then for the last time, we're going to welcome up Jane to do the integrated resources. Mm -hmm. Let's give this her a nice round of applause, Jane. Come on. This is sentimental for Jane mm -hmm. to be able to do this the last time. Never the power broker. Accepting any action items as well, right, Jane? Correct. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the board for all your support. It's been a pleasure here. Um, I've grown quite a bit over the 26 years, and um, it's been a real pleasure, and I'm looking forward to moving on um, in this new role as general manager at Holden. So thank you all very Congratulations, much. Congratulations, Jay. You. Congratulations. Yes. Um, so I only have three quick slides for you. It's a short month. Um, the first slide looks at uh, 2016 through 18, the coincident peak with RMLD's load. This kind of talks to uh, Mr. Talbot's question. So historically, um, the pink column shows what the ISO's peak is. And as you can see, in 2016, uh, the ISO's peak was 25,596 megawatts. Um, and we hit a higher peak this year of 25,763. That's preliminary. That won't finalize from the ISO, but we believe that occurred on August 20. 
9th at um, 6 p.m. Our load on that occasion was 159.643, and that compares to 163 in 2016. So again, um, to Dave's question, how much does the Shred the Peak really get involved? Uh, one of the differences in 2018 from 2016 that occurred is we had our generator online. So uh, we had a 2.3 megawatt reduction. Um, however, when you just do the ratios of the 16th versus the total and the 18th versus the total and then subtract the, um, the 2.3, that there's a significant decrease in RMLD's peak. Um, and it, it's in the range of three to five megawatts. Um, so we have some solar on, we have some PDR programs with our commercial customers, as well as our Shred the Peak Alert. We had 2,000 customers signed up specifically uh, that we contact on the summer basis, as well as going forward um, to reduce our transmission peak. Uh, so the customers have act actually taken an active interest. And again, just on very basic uh, ratios, um, we're going to send out a report to them that um, there was a significant decrease in 2018 versus 2016. Um, and so that's... Oh, that deserves a little... <laughs> yeah, no, and again, again, my group did a really great job in terms of trying to educate. Uh, we had a couple sessions at various libraries. We had a session here in January just to kind of explain to people why we want to shred the peak, the cost impact to that. Um, and our customers seem to really be embracing that and working with us um, to try to, to re reduce that amount. And, um, you know, you can see that it is um, occurring um, between th these last yeah, it, it was years. It was well done. I mean, the challenge is uh, we had a lot of almost shaved the peak Correct. Days. And it's a repetitive process. Yeah. So you, what you don't want people to do is get discouraged because, yeah. like, how many times are they going to call yeah. this? But I think it was handled well and, um, and how it got communicated. Yeah, thank so. you very much, Tom. I, I think uh, the, the group did a really great job. Um, and so the next slide looked as um, the day-ahead prices. So within our ISO model, we have day-ahead and real-time prices. And um, we looked at August 12th, which was the peak in 2016. June 17th, which is kind of an anomaly, very rare for ISO to, to peak in June, but that did occur in 2017. And on um, this year, as I mentioned before, it was on August 29th. So it's, it's kind of difficult. To, uh, the black line would be the 16 peak. Uh, in, in June of 2017 was the light blue line. And in August, the prices were a little higher during those peaks. So again, anytime we can reduce that power, that translates into less power that we're buying in the day ahead markets at those prices. And then uh, the final slide uh, looks at real time prices. Um, and as you can see here in 20, uh, this is kind of just the opposite. So because uh, that peak was fairly high in, uh, in uh, 2016, the light pink line prices went all the way up to $360 in real time. Um, however, in the next two sub subsequent years, 2017 and 18, um, prices were, again, it's a peak day, loads are high, generators, the, the very dirty, you know, uh, oil burning units are burning, um, and so that tends to cause the prices on those peak days to be, to be significantly higher than on a typical off-peak period or even a shoulder month period. So prices were... Um, half the prices that they were uh, in 2016. That's all I have for you this, this month. Questions for Jane? Uh, Looks good. I, I, just, I just have one more comment. Even though you won't be in Reading, we'll always be holding you in our hearts. Oh. Oh. So I just wanted to say oh. that. Oh. Oh. Jane, Jane, Jane has something. You've been working on that for like six I, I thought about it a few minutes ago. I was starting to smile. I was just thinking about it. Jane, may I just say a few things? Yeah. Uh, Jane has been here as long as I have. Wow. Yeah, she was originally, Vinnie Cameron was originally brought in to run the Energy Services Division. She was in third grade. And, and the, first, and the first, first person she hired was Jane. We stole Jane out of Emwink. <laughs> yes, on that. So thank you, Jane, for all of the years. It's and been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And I'm sure, Holden, you're going to be wearing many, many hats out yeah. there. <laughs> many hats. I'm well aware of what Holden is. I've got friends who live in Sterling. So 
um, you'll, there'll be many hats and many responsibilities you'll have out there. So <laughs> congratulations and good luck, okay? Mm. Yeah, nicely done. Mm. 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 Hamid, you're back up here? Wow. Engineering and operations. I guess we could say you have Muni friends here. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Getting <laughs> <laughs> worse. Hello again. I'm reporting the month of July and August 2018, the engineering and operations report. The first slide you see the expenditures for the month of July and August and year to date actual and what's remaining from the budget, what was budgeted basically. Those are the projects you see the expenditures on the right. The second uh, the slide talks about the routine capital constructions. These are the pole hits, uh, the overhead underground uh, subdivisions uh, that we do. Uh, we uproot everything, as I explained, that you know, we got many of those uh, projects that are assi assigned that they require the pole damage replacement, uh, hazmat oil spills, the station uh, work, any work we, we need to do inside the st station, replacing the uh, lightning arresters, or porcelain cutouts, animal guards, and you know, all of those that uh, bring the year uh, to date to 310,295,000 uh, dollars. The next slide shows the facilities, IRD and IT, basically the expenditures you see. And uh, year to date uh, is $910,325. That uh, the remaining balance uh, from what was budgeted is $6,660,164. The next slide shows the routine construction. The next one, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> routine uh, maintenance, uh, those maintenance, uh, uh, the scheduled maintenance programs that you know we created, we developed back in 2014. And the first one, transformer replacement, we have approximately 30% of the pad bump, the underground system is replaced and they're upgraded. The overhead is approximately 22%. Uh, the pole inspection program, you know, we have replaced so far 237 poles which 189 of those has been transferred and we continue keeping up with the transfers. The inspection of the feeders, these are all the circuits. You see that quarterly we are inspecting feeders and uh, to make sure nothing is going wrong and if any there is any potential failures or potential problems, we try to fix them. Manhole inspections, it's going on schedule as expected, 961 out of uh, 1,237, and the portion cutout replacements as we are going through May to the developments and also the feeders making, making all these upgrades, we take this opportunity to replace those with a polymer type. So those are all going well. The next slide is tree trimming. We had three tree spans in the month of July and 31 spans in the month of August. And year to date, we have 64 spans through the August. We had some hazardous trees that they had to be taken down and you know we got uh, taking those this is the time to do them before we, you reach the winter time with the storms and it is so we have taken care of uh, lot, lots of those as well also along the uh, the railroad track the feed from station four to station five that you know uh, it's they needed heavy trimming and also they are being done the substation maintenance program, the infrared scan, uh, so far we haven't found anything, obviously, because we keep a good uh, maintenance of all the equipment at the substation, so we haven't found anything uh, that is a concern. Uh, the underground subdivision upgrades, there you see that, you know, we continuously upgrading those and we're going through those, as I uh, explained the last time, because I've got 50 or 60 development that they all aged you know they need to based on the age and the uh, condition of the equipment we have prioritized them and we're going through these the developments uh, uh, upgrading uprooting basically everything upgrading all the equipment the cables the transformers poles everything so uh, those are the list of the projects that they completed and we got some projects that, that are in progress as 
So this is right now, it's becoming uh, one of the priorities. I've got many priorities, but this is right now the highest priority because, you know, uh, lots of these undergrounds, you know, they're old, 40, 45 years old, as old as me. You know. mm. <laughs> so, uh, the next poll is, the next one, the slide is double polls. The, that's a question I said, approximately we have 16,000 polls. Uh, the ownership is 50-50, but the custodial are uh, in the Reading, they split between Reading and uh, Ryzen. And the uh, North Reading is RMLD, Linfield is Verizon, and Wilmington is Verizon. So the custodial are uh, split between Verizon and uh, RMLD. The next poll, uh, the next uh, slide is the uh, engines, the, uh, the report that we get from that system that's shared between uh, Comcast, Verizon, and us, and also fire department for e in every town. So we know whose ball is in court and uh, you know, and whose responsibility is to do the transfers and when you set the new polls. In town of Linfield, RMLD has uh, approximately 19 polls to replace to, uh, uh, to actually do the transfers. They have done the also and set the polls already. North Reading, we have nine transfers <coughs> and 44 poll bots that they need to be removed. In Reading, <coughs> we have uh, one transfer to do. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. In Reading, we have got 27 transfers and 18 poll bots to do, to remove. And in town of Wilmington, we have uh, RMLD has 28 transfers and four poll uh, bots that they need to be removed out of the ground. We have lots of construction going on, as, the, the, as I've mentioned in the past. You know, we've got lots and lots and lots of improvements, that system improvements that the, the people they see, the trucks are out there, they're making for the reliability reasons. So there are lots of, you know, these pole uh, transfers, they see that they're, they're taking place, the double <coughs> poles, uh, that we are taking them and we are doing the transfers in a timely manner. We don't have any control over the Verizon and Comcast. Sometimes <coughs> if you see those poles there, sitting there for, you know, a few weeks or a few months, uh, we do the best we can, but they have the same system, so they know this is the ball is in their court, and they need to move on. Uh, but you know, it's out of our control. The next slide shows you the reliability indices, basically it's SADI, KD, and SAFI, and they're all well under national and regional averages. So we are all doing good. Uh, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, the SAFI that you see, it's a little bit up, this year, because of all these uh, problems that we've had with the trees, the trees that unexpectedly, you know, they're coming down, you know, shallow roots, lots of rain, and you know, these trees, they fall, and we need that. We've had quite a few of those in Reading, North Reading, and also Wilmington area, and mm -hmm. some in Linfield. So that's mm -hmm. the cause of that, these pockets of outages that they're caused by them. So that's why that one's a little bit up. Uh, the next slide showing the causes of outages uh, as of August 2018. You see that you know the trend; it's pretty much going down based on when you compare them, them comparing them to the five years average from two 2013 to 2017. So for 2018 and now, uh, you know it's there. See that you know these numbers they going down. Uh, so and that shows that we are on the right track of our maintenance program is working basically mm. that's what it shows yep. that concludes my report if you have any questions I'll be more than happy to questions anybody the best you can and yeah, Jason whenever we, you always are open for questions yeah, it looks good Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I, mean, uh, I think yes. you're staying up here, Hamid, right? Yes. You have. Uh, you want to oh, buy some some metal? No, some meters. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, motion. Would you like me to read okay. the motion? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, move that IFP. 2019.03 for Cooper Power Systems meters and equipment for the AMI mesh network system expansion and migration be awarded to Canon Technologies Inc., <coughs> an affiliate of Eaton Corporation PLC, doing business as Eaton for $274,380, pursuant to MGL Chapter 
56D on the recommendation of the general manager. Okay, we have a second. Second. Do you want to give us the background on so this? By all means, this is as I explained as part of the mesh network expansion. So right. we're replacing these meters to uh, put the strength more into the mesh network mm -hmm. and make the network stronger for two-way communications between the meters and the SCADA. And uh, so the lowest responsible responsive bidder was Camel Technologies. I mean, the last time we sent a bid to 15 bidders and only two, they, you know, they, they, they responded. And the one that responded, they only responded on one item, which was, you know, substantially more than what the successful bidder was. So this time around, we used chapter 164 and we gave it to the same um, vendor. And, you know, it's, uh, it came out really reasonably, you know, below what we expected, which is 274,380. Thousand uh, dollars, so that's what the story is with that. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Yeah. Question. Uh, yes. Uh, I noticed there wasn't any kind of yeah. You know, what you budgeted for this right. anywhere in the material? Do you know how much you budgeted this for? On this one, it was budgeted. Let me take a look at it. That was for two thousand. You see that anywhere again? in the right? I didn't see. No, I didn't see anywhere in the the proposal here in the write up. Usually we put the budget, what it's budgeted for. In yeah, the usually we should do it. I believe it was 300. Let me take a look at it. Can I take a look at that budget thing? It might be in this big thing here. The mesh network. Second page. It was oh, right there. 300. For the F519, right it was. Uh, yeah, n n line number 33? Yeah, that's right. It's 121,000. And, uh, but this one is. 300. For a CY19 and FY, total together. That's, you know, that means $300,000 that we're asking for FY. These meters, they're not going to come in until for the 2019, so it's it less is. than 300,000. So it's less than 300,000 yeah. dollars, right? So it's 300,000. So okay. Here. So you you order them now; they won't be. You order them until. now, and it takes okay. you know for manufacturer to put them together and send them in different shipments. They right. take, you know, it takes quite. It just time. you know I did not see it in the write up that you you're giving us here. Yeah. Um, so can I make it a point that you put that in in the future, please? Yeah, sure, definitely. Okay. By all means, mm -hmm. yes, we should have. I'm yep. sorry mm -hmm. that I wasn't there. We usually put that item in there. So we don't yeah, have to go scramble right. Usually they <laughs> usually prepare them, put them, <laughs> we miss them. So we put them back the next time. Okay, any other questions? No. No. All right, all those in favor? Five zero zero. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay. I guess let's go. I think we should go back to sure. item seven. Right, item seven. Everything else been covered? Yeah, we covered everything. Well, just to, we're going to do the meetings at the end for the next board okay, meeting. Right. We'll do that, that at the fine. end. We'll go to seven. So okay. why don't we go to item seven, and that is the issue of the payment of the town. Okay. And okay. Is it me to all set? Oh, I mean, do you have everything you no, need? No, no, no. If, if you yeah. want to stay here, I'm more than happy to. No, no wherever no, you no. want to sit. Okay. I don't no, know. No, no, no. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So me. I was going to make just a couple comments, and then yeah. Noah and I can talk. Uh, right. So you about that? If that's okay. About the payment for the town? Yeah. Ready? Sure. Yeah. You guys are the committee members, so yeah. Yep. Right. Um, so so Colleen um, completed a study, or worked on a study anyway, mm -hmm. uh, and did some excellent analysis um, on the payment to the town and the different metrics and variables that could be considered, uh, along with the charter of the RMLD and what we're trying to strive to create here and it was tied also to the RMLD six-year strategic plan which is you know, many times you don't see that that mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the study is not tied necessarily to this strategy but but this was um, and the key in all of this is really the convergence and when we're talking about the convergence we've heard it here over the last X number of meetings is the kilowatt hour <laughs> sales are seemingly decreasing and yet we have an increasing payment uh, to the town of Reading, um, which at the, uh, in the worst case, uh, would leave us uh, in the out years drastically short of any kind of net income 
actually net income would go negative by some of the scenarios that have been projected. So we'd have no way to build up our capital reserves for right. the future. And that's really the, what we're trying to wrestle with here in terms of, of getting an answer. Um, so, um, and the metrics that I'm talking about here are uh, how should you track this? Should it be the CPI, which has been used historically? Uh, should it be percent of net plant? Should we use some other metrics such as mills per kilowatt hour? And there's, there's good arguments, I think, on uh, all sides, although I, I think that there's, uh, given where we are today, there's perhaps a leaning to one versus the other uh, in terms of being able to choose something. Um, so Colleen and, and Wendy and Amit have put together uh, two to three scenarios in terms of projections for the future uh, about what this could mean. And what I'm talking about is wrapping this into a financial analysis like we've just seen here in terms of uh, decreasing kilowatt hour sales, what that means in terms of revenue, uh, work embedding all the various costs that are associated with it. And uh, it has some uh, very interesting uh, repercussions in terms of which scenario that you're, you're looking at and which assumptions you're using. So um, what I'd like to propose uh, is that we submit these um, uh, scenarios to, along with uh, the modified study, uh, to the subcommittee uh, by the weekend uh, so that the subcommittee has a chance to look at the scenarios, get grounded in what the financials really mean, understand the background that uh, Colleen used to write the study in the first place, uh, and then, uh, then that, by the way, that's on Tuesday night next week that we have this, this meeting. And are there two, two CAB members or just one CAB member? There's one there's CAB two, member, I believe, right? No, there's two, so there's two, CAB two, members. two CAB members. Neil and, okay. and, Neil and George. Yeah. George, okay. right, great, very good. Right. Um, and then we can uh, certainly discuss the implications of what mm -hmm. those financial implications are within that. And then um, return to the board for approval of uh, what we think is the correct scenario by our next board meeting or if we need to put it in place before then, before right. we make, make sure we meet town meeting, mm -hmm. you know, we can do that. And I, uh, I think that uh, just uh, my own opinion, and I think Phil perhaps shares this with us, is that this, this transition um, uh, is, is a change and no community likes to see massive changes happening right. overnight. Not to suggest that it would be massive at all because mm -hmm. things could change. I mean, the, the convergence curve we're talking about, if everybody went out and bought an electric car, you know, we would not have this problem, right? It would start kicking back up again. So um, we always hope for the best. But given the sort of the facts of the situation, we think that trying to develop a consensus around that, perhaps holding the payment for one year through CY19 um, steady in terms of what it has been, and then implement a new system, or I shouldn't say a new, a different system of calculating what the rate should be to Reading so that we can preserve, at least for a six-year period of time, the ability to fund our system, to fund the capital, and to make sure that in the future we have enough capital to keep um, on top of the maintenance and everything else that we, we, uh, we need for the uh, system reliability. So, so that's basically what I'd like mm -hmm. to suggest that mm -hmm. we do, uh, if the board is, would agree with that. So by tomorrow uh, sometime we'll have a few uh, spreadsheets that kind of lay out some thoughts, a little bit of background, uh, and uh, perhaps some of the other draft. The study right now is stamped draft. I think mm -hmm. we um, just need to, perhaps Colleen needs to review certain portions of that and then take the draft off uh, and we right. can send it to the committee and then we can have a discussion at the committee about the implications, what it means, right. et cetera. So, and then yeah. hopefully be able to develop consensus within the subcommittee, bring it back to the board for our approval or disapproval. So let me let me go so forward, a, let me yeah. go forward with that. A um, couple things, and um, Mr. O'Rourke actually has pointed out to me that uh, some of the numbers that are in the Town of Reading Payment CPI column may not be in the right order. Um, I believe Mr. O'Rourke has, has pointed out that some of these numbers may need to be corrected and, and put in the right order at this point because I don't think they're in the right order. I also, you know, we got a couple blanks in here for under the, and we got the 2018-19, the 
we should come up with some comparable numbers that are that are comparable to those those numbers there. So we kind of fill in the whole picture on that one. So this is what we talk about when about adjusting some of these things, um, you know. And then I think at that point, you know, maybe it, it's appropriate to take the draft off. We make some of these changes over the weekend at this point. Um, I agree with everything John said. The only thing that I dif differ on and it's how we work out in the committee is I'd like to see this stay put for two years as opposed to one. And I'd like to see two years because I think that would give the town the warning that they need to do some, some uh, economic development. Give them the two years of economic development. But that's something we will work out in the committee mm -hmm. at this point. You know, and I know that we talk about economic development for ages. And I don't know if everybody saw the community meeting last night. I was not able to attend on that. Uh, but they did talk about the downtown area last night. I'm not sure exactly what came out of that at this point uh, but I wasn't because I was not able to attend but I think that's my thought to do it for two years and then potentially you know we need to get away from the CPI um, I'm not crazy about the net of plant net percentage of plant I'm not crazy about that at all no right um, it doesn't seem to be and connected I think the, to the mills the mills per kilowatt hour and even during this two-year period you know I had the crazy thought that if you know if the if we use a three the three point five and those and the actual numbers come in to be higher than what we would what we'd have at the freeze. Maybe we do something with that if the numbers came in higher during that period of time, possibly. But again, these are things we worked out in, in the subcommittee. But I do think we need to adjust, you know, those items that I brought up here to get adjusted in on the on the, the report. Right. And we'd probably not right. take it out as far as it shows on that chart. Yeah, either. you said six yeah. years was a good way uh, you know, to go. I, yeah, I might actually pre prefer five years, five but years. I know we have a six-year plan, so I right. think that ties with a six-year yeah, perspective. Yeah, okay. I, I think taking it for six years would be fine, too. In ten years, who knows where anybody's going to be, right? And I think well, trying to read the crystal ball that far into the I, I will stop. not be here in ten years. <laughs> <laughs> you said that 20 years ago. <laughs> Tom? Okay. You are you, are you, no, yeah, yeah I, we're, we're, we're good. good. We're good. Yeah, so, so uh, just a few comments. So uh, I guess I've, since I've thought about it, so if, if you look on the, on the back page of the study, the, the two alternate right. recommendations are blank. You know, the reason they're blank is because obviously they're, they wouldn't be implemented till this year. I guess the point is, if you want to make an a, a, apples to apples comparison, they right. need to put a comparable figure put, in. The, the numbers are the same for 17 and 18 because <laughs> we're, they were already done the deal system. Yeah. So yeah, so I guess as long as people understand that. Yeah, I mean, I was looking to put maybe the, the 3.5 in each of those two numbers and then just work it out going forward to the next column over possibly in, the, in that first two columns and maybe the two and a half on the, 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 the two right-hand columns potentially. Does that make like sense, that. Colleen, to you what Phil's saying? Yeah, the, the, the error in the first column is that uh, it's, uh, instead of CY19, it's FY19, and then it just moves down one. So the the num the payments aren't wrong. It just it it aligns because we switch from a fiscal year to a calendar right. year. Right. So I'll just clarify that. Yeah. The um, the the yeah. The only thing they need to understand is when you do the calculation, it's for the year before, right? Yes. It's, you know what I mean. So like it, under the uh, what says CY20, which is really right. 19. Well, you, you, you would take the audited. You know, you take your okay. final sales at the end of the calendar year. All right, so maybe maybe we need to put a little right. a numeral in there, number one, that, and define what maybe some definition of that. Yeah, where actually, that what I think would be from. very helpful is maybe just one example for the first year under the new arrangements. Yeah, just do one example. If, if I cut this, let's see. so um, because so example, yeah, the three point five mills under what says CY twenty. Is based on the 655, 923, 460 number. That's how the formula works. So it's not, it's not horizontal. You have to go up one. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that'll be obvious to the right. subcommittee members. Right. But but the, the so the general comments I wanted to just <coughs> reinforce, uh, and I agree with what John and Phil have laid out. So one is that um, I think it's always good to ground everybody, and the reality is. The payments to date have been based on a, a picking a 1997 number. Maybe Phil's the only one who would remember where that came from, and continuously adding the the CPI index to right. it, regardless of performance of the utility. So, so that's really why, in part, it's unsustainable because it keeps going up and up. Even if we had flat revenues in a year, it, it keeps growing mm -hmm. and growing, and it's got to the point right. that 
Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a baseline comment. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the realities that you guys have brought out of lower declining revenues and improved efficiencies uh, that they also impact that, that, that piece. And then uh, I guess what I would also suggest is that we, uh, we look at uh, reviewing this thing, uh, you know, in a couple of years. I, I think that it's, this is new territory, I mean, declining revenues. I mean, I've been on the board a short time, but Phil, I don't know if you've, <laughs> You haven't seen declining revenues for a few years straight. It have depends you? upon what the economy has been. I mean, back yeah. in the eighties, we were going great. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know? generally speaking, yeah. companies, you right. know, yeah. if they have a bad year, they rebound the next yeah. year. You know, they yeah. don't stay flat for or, or decline every year. So, right. I think whatever I'd suggest it from for discussion at the subcommittee, maybe looking at yeah. a review so we can better understand. The, and lastly, the only reason for showing the number of years, which I agree with Joe, I mean, it's hard to predict. The, the the only value of the exercise is as you it, is it's continued out. Don't forget this is predicated on the capex spend eventually catching up with our, catching up with our infrastructure. So I just did a quick off the top calculations for the first five years. The town payment under that uh, first scenario decreases about eighty thousand per year each year. But then after that, it has a very moderate. It's like fifteen to twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. So. That's the that's that's missing. If you cut that off, and I'll leave that up to you guys. You, you're going to be in in meeting. So the only reason for the whole display is it basically what it says in the early years because we're investing so much capex, we can't afford not to do that. And, and that's a worst case scenario. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we should point that out. That well, I mean, if we started dropping two percent or three percent per year, it'd be worst case. But yeah. we we think at one percent, it's worst case from yeah. what we've seen from the trend lines yeah. and from historical perspective. So. Yeah. Uh, if anything, it could be a, there could be an upside to this where it doesn't drop off, and that's fine. Right. Yeah. And I say I guess my last comment, which I think is obvious, but uh, maybe to the listening audience unaware of it, we began this process with the request to look at how payments could be increased, and what we quickly discovered is that right. we can't do that. In fact, they they have to take a declining, right. uh, flattening approach just because of the, the realities right. we talked about. Right, in order, in order for the, the system to sustain itself. Yep. Exactly. But the present way it was going is that the system would just not be able to sustain itself going forward. So in essence, you know, even though it did maybe the opposite of what was intended, it came out to be, the result came out to be a, a something that we should have been looking at maybe all along, quite yep. truthfully, yep. at yep. this point. And so, and I did want to say Colleen uh, deserves some recognition. Uh, Colleen deserves you know, we were going to sub this out to a consultant, and I think... Uh, John, I know that you that your work, uh, the report's pretty impressive. I think it's very impressive. Yeah. Get, get so for doing consult. this for saving money, do I get three spaces in my parking lot? <laughs> 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 I was just about to say. Yeah, modern. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. So, uh, thank you, Dave. Well, I thought you wanted your own profit. I think she's teaching modern you. Modern leadership, we don't no, give any good. The only thing in terms of reviewing it, I think, you know, my idea would be every three years to review it. Every three years to look at it. I mean, I yeah. think five years would seems just, reasonable. Five That's years fine. is too too. Far and every year out. is yeah. too much. I mean, yeah. the strategy pl plan is reviewed every year, right. so I think three and, years and is fine. You know, especially they're, they're, starting out in this. You know, and it yeah. could be, you know, God forbid, you know, we have a Hurricane Michael coming through here, you know, and basically wiping out the system. If that were to happen, this payment is is basically gone at that point. That could scratch. Hurricane Michael comes through. Right. You know, and wipes this, you know, does it demonstrate, you know, it's been, what, 25 years we had a hurricane here in Massachusetts? We, we got to be due, we yeah. got to be due sometime, you know? Yeah. So. It, Tom, did you have any more to that? No, I'm good, thank is you. It, Dave? Is it correct that we, I just want to make sure that, because I think I've been saying this, that we're the largest payment in the state among municipals? Okay. Good, because it's in the minutes that we voted. I think I vote. <laughs> <laughs> I said yeah. it last week. <laughs> I thought it was correct. Yes. You wanted to make sure it was yeah, the, the it right. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to just re restate the backdrop. Uh, you know, is that it's the largest payment in the state, so it's, it's worth noting. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, I agree with all the comments, and um, I think we have a good plan. I think what yep. John and Phil suggested <laughs> makes sense. Uh, I don't think we don't have to vote because you guys are already agreeing to meet, right? Yep. So yep. Uh, I, yep. I think what we can do is uh, maybe get a couple spreadsheets laid out as we we've, we've got here. Uh, get the report by tomorrow just cleaned up a little bit and then we'll circulate Monday. it to everybody right. obviously here as well as the uh, 
subcommittee. That works for everyone. Right. Right, and we can get it to the whole cab mm -hmm. too, obviously, right? Oh, of course yeah. the cab. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course the cab. cab. That's what yeah. I meant. Yeah. I think we probably. Yes, I need to just to walk through maybe one or two of the numbers here in terms of the implications right. of the spreadsheet. And then if we could issue this maybe Monday morning as a, as a final. Would Monday morning fine. would be good. Monday yeah. morning to issue it as a would final. That Does that yeah. work for you? You, got, you don't mind working over the weekend, right? Um, oh, I forgot. This is a <laughs> utility. <laughs> <laughs> it's only like line guys who are <laughs> climbing the Does falls. Does that work, Colleen? The Monday, what John's saying about um, release. about printing out the four modules. Well, one's the but the six-year budget, and then there's three modules that we did. Is, is that what you're asking? For? No, no, I don't. I don't think the the I mean, budget. I think the report with a report with some minor corrections this, on it. The study, yep. the study, right. Just, yep. the study, and then these the maybe two supporting scenarios that are the financials that look out going forward. What the implication of our recommendation is. Okay. That's that's is that here. Doable? That's embedded in here. I mean, this is. Is that doable, Bob? Oh, yeah. They're they're done now. They yeah, just. I just, I just want to double check what you want me. So there's is the the date correction. There's some um, little asterisks with some explanations right. saying that it's the previous year's uh, sales mm -hmm. that makes up for the calculation. I'm going to take it. Uh, should I take it down to the to the metric of three percent and two percent to say because that's where you're leveling off? Um, yeah, I think we want to go at least that far, right? We were saying right. go out at least six well, years. Six, six years. years. I only, only go six years. Yeah. yeah we have the so six does that take plan. us to the twenty-five or twenty-six? I wasn't going to redo every chart on no. present day to match today's budget, right? No. So no. We're just no. Leaving no. The data from no when none I of today. that. Right. I'd suggest that we, we just have a, an um, offline discussion to make sure that we're all in agreement on the on the spreadsheet right. because it re that it reflects this right. because I think it gives more information than just the uh, one pager. So I think That's it all. goes down to I believe if I'm correct where it says CY twenty five. That actually should be CY24. Yeah, CY24. So I, I believe that. Yeah. And that's as low as we have to yeah. go. That's CY24 is where we're stopping. Yeah, but excuse me. Again, the only reason I, and you can separate it so you can focus on it, the, the story gets significantly better. As I said, you're going to average $80,000 more or less decrease each year. When you get sure. to that cutoff point, it goes down to 18000 So. Uh, Everyone knows it's a projection, but I'm just saying that's the benefit. Uh, it, it goes, it levels off. Well, is what you're saying? Well, just yeah. look at look at your numbers. It's uh, right. it's C what's well, labeled CY twenty four. It's one point nine, then it goes to one point eight seven one, then one eight five right. two, one eight three four. It almost stops dropping. Yeah, yeah. well, it does it because what we it deliberately because the capex is is at that point starts. I'm guessing that's part of the explanation, right? The capex, whatever the. No, because you're you're transitioning from 3.5 to get down to what the metric is. Yeah. I mean, typically oh, you're bottoming up. You're bottoming out. He's yeah. saying the metric in. for kilo, for mills per kilowatt hour is 2.5. Right. He's saying to leave these in. We're not saying 2.5. Oh, no. We're saying no, no. It's no. Still it just might scare people. You can't, yeah. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yeah. It just you know it, it's it's too hard to predict that what's going to happen after the six years. Yeah. I agree. I mean you're you're going to ask you know if we're going to do that then. You know, I'd ask Colleen to do the spreadsheet all to cover all those years, and that's just too much work. That's too much to do. And I mean, we don't know. And we don't know. That. We don't know enough about that. Yeah. We're, we're we're guessing. Yeah, Tom. I think what I you're mean, saying. I mean, I don't mean we're guessing, but it, we're guesstimating. Tom, guesstimating. it's just because we're, we're what Colleen did yeah. was drop yeah. it slowly. It's like a gradual drop from 3.5 by 10 basis points down to three. That's the only reason that levels off, right? Right, but but. But the reality is, if this all things being equal, which it's true for even a five-year look, the reality is the payments would would decline at a much slower rate. Yeah. Well, well don't forget because the percentage yeah. stops dropping. Yeah, there are rate increases too, though. Right. That are right. embedded yeah, in this. Right. But this is based on kilowatt hour sales. Right. So this is just saying that your kilowatt hour sales is going down by one percent per year. Right. But it, that but, may yeah. not happen. So this is a. This is what it looks like Correct. if it went down 1% every right. year. If it doesn't go down 1% every year, then your payment's going to be higher than what's here. Right. right. But, you know, I, I could make the argument in the, in the 
calendar year 2029, Amazon 3 would come move their headquarters here. Mm. You know? <laughs> because you of know? our load, like Disney <laughs> got. Yeah. You could say that about five years, I mean, too. You know? Yeah. That's why I think the six year plan is, is you know, cut it off at six years would be the best thing to do. Uh, the, the uh, I'm fine with that. As well, the payment in the first column, because a note needs to be added, uh, you know, what the town had asked was, you know, the CPI, if it's less than 2.5, it's a 2.5 floor to a 5% ceiling. Mm. Okay? All this column does is add 2.5 every year, which wasn't asked for, it was just a scenario. It's like, so if we just increased it every year by CY24 or whatever it was. That's the left column. No, that's 2.5. 2. 2. 5. Right, right. right. Yeah. Again, that's the what it was. That's what it was. The been point like. was the convergence. And right. then, yeah. You know, the models and that we did right. was to show more convergence. Exactly. And the models that we have show that in the out years, in the six out years, you go negative. I mean, that was the point of the convergence: negative, right, dropping. And that's why I think it's important to show the the level of uh, data that's behind this. That you know, it's it's not just sort of numbers picked. There's a lot of uh, data that you've used. To substantiate what's here, and so I think six years is fine. I think having a few alternatives in terms of um, how you might use a metric for this, or mills per kilowatt hour, and that's what we're sort of gravitating towards because it's it's, it's real. I mean, it's more, more tied to something. And I I would also recommend we do not have a cap of like five percent on a CPI uh, basis. Uh, I mean, if if the CPI went up to to five and the town would expect that I mean that aggravates this dramatically I mean it would really be mm -hmm. dropping it twice the rate that we're seeing so um, I, I think we just need to be careful about the recommendations yeah. is, is, to, is it I, I don't know this is, is projecting a 2.5 percent increase for the next five years is that re reality do you mean the CPI the CPI it looks like it's gonna be higher than that I think it already yeah. is yeah, 2.5 is, is kind of what the, the Fed is going. Fed, but I mean, Fed beyond just, yeah. as, I don't know if anyone's projected. Yeah. No, the Fed is, interest, yeah, is raising interest rates, so and they anticipate they're going to raise more next year. Okay. Unless, yeah, I'm unless, just asking unless the present administration removes them all. If it doesn't, then we're, <laughs> yeah. we're sort of yeah. overstating. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like we have consensus, <laughs> right? <laughs> it sounds like we're good. Yeah. 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 Is there, yeah. Am I sending this to John, one person, to take a look at? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Changes. You'll be the uh, yes. point. Well, both of you guys. I'll be, be the point well, man. I'll be a point man. Uh, I'd like to reveal it with Phil. Yeah, that's fine. As well. No problem. And uh, so by Monday morning, then we'll we take and send it to uh, the CAB members, everyone on the board, uh, and the uh, town. Yeah. Right. Colleen and I were just talking just because to make it fit in the presentation, some of the charts are a little bit of an eye chart, so I think she said she could expand them so they're more, more readable for the, yeah. which I think would be helpful for everybody. Sure. All right. Great. Okay. Wendy, moving on. Oh, yes, Wendy. Sorry, I'm sorry. When do you want the information? Oh, sometime tomorrow. Uh, yeah, and then... Perhaps I could send it to you, Phil, and we could. You mean you're not going to stay late and work tonight? Shit, I, I, <laughs> I worked all day on this. <laughs> what do you mean tonight? <laughs> Mr. Yeah, Chairman, thank tomorrow, you for allowing me to be taking that out of oh, the way. Oh, I know it was very important. Uh, you, you're part we, of the we, committee, we, so. We, we did solve the, the leak problem. <laughs> good, good. Did it pass? Yes, it all did. Right, good. It did. <laughs> All right, so we're going to um, our RMLD board meetings. It looks like the next one is November 15th. Mm -hmm. And the following one, December 20th. Any concerns, anybody? Uh, let me just take I haven't checked my Christmas party calendar, but. Uh, <laughs> November 15th. Maybe. maybe a party in Holden that uh, <laughs> members may be invited to. <laughs> this takes precedence, of course. Okay. Um, no, no concerns. Well, I uh, just uh, well, just a small one. Uh, on the November fifteenth one, is there any chance of moving it to either the uh, well, Monday is Veterans Day, Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday? Is there any chance of? Uh, I'm no, any, all those dates are fine with me. Tuesday, um, I'm tra I'll be away. I'll I can't wait. do Wednesday. Can't do Wednesday. Cab meets on Wednesday. 
Ah, is right, that here? Needs. You want to do the can we do the following Monday? Uh, the 19th? Yeah, what's the 19th look like? 19th is fine. The 19th? The 19th works for me. How about you guys? Looking. Colleen? All right. Yep. 19th. Tracy, does that work? Yeah. All right, 19th it is. Okay. The subcommittee meets on Tuesday. What time is it that meeting going to start, Tracy? We're starting at 5.30? Okay. It's an open meeting, so any commissioner who wants to come can come. And that is at the... Here. It's right here. It's right here. Yeah. Tuesday at what time? At 5.30. 5.30. GM conference room? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And our 19th meeting is the normal 7.30 start, right? Yeah. Now I'm 19th. And then December 20th, how does that look for everybody? That's fine with me. I think December it's, I think 20th. It's fine. It looks like uh, getting it could close be a, to Christmas. Uh, it's getting very yeah. Christmas party around then. Yeah, uh, I right. Think I mentioned that. Didn't I? Yeah, December twentieth. Pretty late. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. I got a Christmas party the next day. <laughs> 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 what do you guys? Should we just leave it? I think leave it. You want? Yeah. You want to do the thirteenth, the week before? Thirteenth. The 13th? No, that's the one I can't do. I can't do the 13th. Yeah, that, that puts the November and December meetings pretty close together. Too. Okay. All right, you want to just leave it for the 20th for now? Yeah, we can talk, the, about we yeah. talk about it in November. Right. I have a feeling things might show up on people's calendar for that yeah. time. Okay. Uh, you're going to do the, the read? The meeting notice All right. Okay. Jane, will you be there at these meetings? <laughs> I'm supposed to say, yeah, I put him well, in there. Well, they're public meetings. I think oh. <laughs> this is how we do it in Holden. Just saying. <laughs> and then the cab dates, we have um, November 18th. Or November, we don't have a date yet yeah, for Tom. I think they just. Uh, November 14th. 14th? Yeah, that happened now, but I made the agenda. So November 14th. It's not likely to be on the, the Tuesday, right? They don't meet on Tuesday, do they? Okay. Because I'll be away. You got that, Tom? Yep. Okay. And you don't have December yet? Okay. So we'll wait for Dave's that. all over that one. Dave's got it covered. Yeah. And then the select board meetings, uh, October 30th. I can't go to that one, but maybe somebody could go. And um, I think I might be able to go. I can't go to either of those, unfortunately. Christmas parties that early? Well, that 13th oh, is that 13th there. of the other date. Well, maybe I could do the 13th. October do we need to go 30th? There? We don't have to. No, we don't have to. We thought it might be good to yeah, have participation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're not assigned. Yeah. Anybody can go to those. Yeah. So. You know, they, they put an agenda, so, you know, read the agenda and see if there's any interest. Okay. You can get on the website and, and read the agenda beforehand. I mean, I'm sure, you're, I'm sure you'd love to go to a street, you know, naming. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> All right. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> Is there anything else anybody wants to say as we before we move to uh, go to executive session? Jason, do you have any? I'm all set. Thank you. Uh, anybody I else? I just would like to say it was a really a nice uh, public power uh, display outside. Oh, and I wanted I, to say, I'm glad you brought that up. I was so impressed with that. Yeah. It was amazing the work that everybody yeah. did. It was a little dog driving a little car somewhere. Right? <laughs> That's right. How that worked. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, no, it was good. Lots of participation. Lots of kids. I think really, in all seriousness, I think it's a great community event. And uh, yeah. I missed the real big flow of people. I came about five o'clock, and but apparently there was hundreds of people earlier. Yeah. Lots of really great participation. Yeah. It's, it's really great to see all. The staff involved. It, uh, very impressive. Yeah, you know, it is the linemen are right. I mean, it's a it is yeah. a nice. Uh, way to like your own companies, you know, getting everybody pitching in, you know, right? Staff to let you know, manufacturing or what alignment, whatever jobs they have, everybody right. kind of helping out it was nice. Really involved the community, it's great, it's nice. All right, okay. all right, so I will. Well, somebody want to make a motion? Sure, uh, move that the board go into executive session to consider the purchase of real property and to discuss confidential, competitively sensitive and proprietary information in relation to making, selling, or distributing electric power and energy and return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Okay. Second. Second. All right. Discussion. Okay. Roll call vote. Mr. Bassino, aye. 
Mr. Stempak, aye. Mr. Hennessy, aye. Mr. Albert, aye. Mr. O'Rourke, aye. All right, moving to executive session. Thank you.